Section 21 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. The Relations of Geology to Physiography in Our Educational System by T. C. Chamberlain There was a time when it was necessary to search for the material of instruction, but that time has passed. Research has not only supplied a sufficiency of intellectual matter, but has overwhelmed us with a plethora of knowledge. There is much, infinitely much, yet to learn, but more is in hand than can be taught. The day of selection has come. It falls to us now, as educators, to look over our several fields and choose that which is most serviceable for general educational purposes, setting aside the remainder for specialists. This is not less true of the field of geography and geology than of the fields of other sciences. The primary question is, what shall be the criteria of our selection? Granting that all knowledge and all culture are good, the question that presses for solution is, what is best? Best on the whole? Best for the average student? Best at the several stages of study? It will be but repeating an ancient and much worn maxim to say that the selection should have high regard for disciplinary culture. It does not follow, however, that disciplinary culture is not compatible with other desirable characteristics, and that these should not determine the selection. An intellectual wrestling with an economic problem or a struggle to gain knowledge inherently valuable may be as disciplinary as though the problem or the knowledge were valueless in itself. The quest is rather to find that which shall possess value in itself when attained together with disciplinary value in its attainment. It is not one merit alone that should be sought, but a combination of the greatest possible merits. The selection should, therefore, have high regard to the value of the knowledge involved. The selection should embrace a due measure of phenomena with which the student may come into direct contact. The more immediately he deals with the phenomena themselves, the more clear and definite will be his basal concepts, and the more solid and tangible his fundamental ideas. The basal factors of thought in any department should be vivid, and in the study of earth forms and earth structure, this vividness may be best derived by work on the part with which the students are in immediate contact. The selection should be such as to call forth not simply observation and acquisition through memory, but the higher mental processes, analysis, induction, imagination, interpretation, and so forth. The selection will fall short of the highest merit if it does not invite and promote a constant inquiry into the causes that lie back of the phenomena, the history through which they have passed, their significance, and the extension and application of the results of the study to remote phenomena and to broader fields. The selection should embrace matter that has inherent and stimulating significance, that will lead students to read similar significances in like phenomena whenever and wherever presented. The value of the selection will be enhanced if it has immediate and evident relationship to human affairs. However beautiful the purely idealistic conception of mental activity and mental acquisition for its own sake may be, the fact remains that we are human beings and more easily and effectively interested in human affairs than in that which is remote from man's interests. If the selection shall have an evident relationship to economical and industrial interests, its effectiveness will be promoted but if it does not also bear upon man's sociological, intellectual, aesthetical, and ethical interests, it will fall short of the full measure of merit. 
it should make its contribution to these not only by helpful knowledge, but by the culture that accompanies its acquisition, by the suggestiveness of its laws, its modes of action, and its analogies. In addition to these qualities, which may be common to other subjects, the selection in each field should be so made as to open to the student a special realm of culture, and to familiarize him with some great factor of thought not equally well developed by any other subject of study. Each great field may be assumed to possess a richness of its own and to be competent to yield a fruitage which has its own peculiar and incomparable qualities. Now, the study of the earth may assume the phase which we term geography, or the phase which we term geology, or the intermediate phase which we are coming to designate physiography. Each of these has its peculiar place and merits. Each makes contributions to the other, and each imposes the duty of selection within its own field. But besides this, there are questions of the interrelationship between these. It falls to me to discuss the relations of geology to physiography in general education. It may be assumed that the natural order of succession of the phases of earth study in our educational system is, first, geography, then physiography, and lastly, geology. A practical question of importance presents itself on the threshold. How far will the best selection and adaptation of subject matter take material from the field of geology and use it in the field of physiography? How far, on the other hand, should physiography relinquish its field to be cultivated in the name of geology? Or, since the field is a common one in a large degree with no sharp dividing lines, what shall we select as the chief subject matter of instruction and training in physiography? The great features of the earth are at once geographic, physiographic, and geologic. We may shift our somewhat arbitrary lines of distinction very much as we see fit. We may choose that which is educationally best with little regard to these. From the geologic standpoint, the physical study of the earth divides its attention between three great elements. First, the agencies and processes engaged in the sculpturing of the land and their results. Second, the agencies and processes concerned in the deposit of the waste of the land in the seas and other basins and in the building up of strata. And third, the internal agencies and processes which disturb and distort the surface and modify the preceding activities and their results. Now, if we are to study processes and agencies in the geologic phase, we must make selection from these three great fields, and our study should embrace agencies and processes if it is to meet the criteria of merit already sketched. To some extent, we may make selection from all these fields, and within limits, this is eminently desirable to give balance, scope, and completeness to the general conception but an equable distribution will prevent thoroughness of study in any one field. Besides, they possess unequal merits as educational factors. There is, furthermore, a natural order of succession that cannot wisely be ignored. That should be selected which comes first to hand in natural order and is least dependent on other factors. It is obvious that the study of the internal forces presents the most obscure and difficult of the three fields. These forces were very influential in determining the grosser outlines of the Earth's physiognomy, but they were only indirectly involved in developing the finer tracings of the Earth's features, the lineaments of which furnish the best subjects of detailed study in the earlier courses. When the selection is limited to a choice between the sculpturing of the land and the deposition of the seas, the application of the criteria above indicated seems at once decisive. We may be said to be everywhere in contact with the land and in the presence of land sculpturing. We are only here and there in contact with the seas 
or other depositional basins, and the processes of strata building and land growth are not everywhere subservient to direct study. We may be said to be constantly dealing with the results of the disintegration, wear, and wastage of the land. We are only here and there immediately concerned in the depositions of the seas or of like agencies. The natural sequence of processes brings the land action first to our study. The material must be loosened and borne down to the basins before it can be deposited. Derivation goes before deposition. The surface shaping processes are simple in part and complex in part. They present a gradation from simplicity to complexity and from ease to difficulty that makes them happily subservient to the skillful teacher in leading scholars on step by step from the mastery of one point to another as their capacities develop and their previous successes warrant. The processes of deposition and of land growth are simpler and have narrower limitations and hence afford a less rich and pliable field for disciplinary endeavors. The surface shaping agencies are more intimately associated with human affairs and more determinative of human interests than are the depositional processes. From many points of view, therefore, if not from all, the sculpturing of the land constitutes a more rich, pliable, and inviting field for the earlier educational processes than the depositional work of the basins or the crust-disturbing activities of the more obscure forces within the earth. Obvious as this seems upon mere statement, it is nevertheless true that the sculpturing of the land has been rather the last than the first field systematically and adequately cultivated by geologists, and contributions from it to geography and physiography have been among the tardiest and thus far among the most incomplete. The earlier efforts of geologists were largely bestowed on the old strata that form the outer part of the crust and that were produced by ancient deposition, and to the great wrinklings and reliefs of the surface produced by the earth's internal forces. It is only within recent years, perhaps we may be justified in saying only within the last decade or two, that the detailed processes by which the surface contours, the drainage features, and the ergonomic adaptabilities were wrought out and are being wrought out have received systematic and analytic study at the hands of any considerable body of specialists. It is now, perhaps for the first time in the history of the earth study, possible to teach effectively the processes by which surfaces take on the forms they possess, and to read the history and the significance of the physiognomy of the land. The face of the land has its ages and stages as truly as does the face of man. It has its babyhood, its youth, its maturity, its advancing age, its senility, and its end. Every portion of the earth is in some one of these ages or stages and is passing on to the next succeeding. There may arise intercurrent events which cut off the history of a landscape, as accidents cut off the history of a man. But a new history begins and a new succession of stages is inaugurated. Every part of the surface of the earth is, therefore, full of significance. Every valley, every stream, is young or old and is working out a definite history. Every hill and every mountain is developing toward maturity or decadence. Every part of the earth carries on its face a record of what is being done, of what has been done, and of what is to be done, unless intercurrent events cut off its natural progress. There is, therefore, a physiognomy of the earth as well as a physiognomy of man, full of interest, full of significance, full of bearings upon industry and upon civilization. This new field, though chiefly opened up by the geologists, is ground common to geography, physiography, and geology. As a field of original investigation, it will doubtless remain largely the possession of the geologists until there shall arise a specialized class of physiographers 
who shall assume its particular cultivation. It is yet rich in unsolved problems and invites the advanced student and the young investigator as well as the expert specialist. In our established educational system, there appear to me sufficient grounds in the considerations offered for urging that this phase of activity should constitute the central training ground in physiography, not to the exclusion of the other departments, but as that basal part of the subject on which the early disciplinary endeavor should be chiefly expended, and from which the work of the beginner may proceed to other fields. Respecting the place of physiography, the same considerations seem to assign it an intermediate position between geography, as usually introduced, and geology. Geography may be said to have, for its special function, the presentation of the features of the earth as they are. Physiography has, for a part of its special field, the study of the physiognomy of the earth as an exhibition of agencies and processes, and as a portrayal of the forces that are making and unmaking the face of the land and influencing its inhabitants. While geology has, for its function, the revelation of the history and structure of the earth and of the forces that work within as well as without it. These are only the salient features. Each has a wider field when given its full compass. It is the peculiar province of geology to teach us something of the extent and significance of time. No study opens up in like degree the great vista of time and extends and amplifies our conceptions in terms of this fundamental condition of thought. Astronomy performs a like function respecting space. These are the twin expansive studies in terms of time and space. The special function of physiography is to develop our perceptions and conceptions of present surface activities and environment and to give us an intellectual command of the agencies which are constantly engaged in molding its configuration into that wide variety and expressiveness and that diverse utility which gives to its intellectual and physical reactions upon the human race such scope and potency in the development of human civilization. Not the least of my purposes has been to invite attention to the important contributions which recent studies have made to physiographic study and to the important place it is entitled to occupy in our educational system. It is my conviction, as already indicated, that physiography should be given a distinct recognition under this distinctive term and a definite place in our curricula intermediate between geography as usually understood and geology. To avoid possible misunderstanding, permit me to say that I recognize, as already intimated, the breadth of the field appropriate to physiography. It may be made to embrace the entire physical environment of man and so to include large factors of meteorology and astronomy, as well as the distribution and physical relations of plants, animals, the races of man, and the types of civilization. Its realm is broader than that of either geography or geology, and in this breadth and comprehensiveness lies one of its claims to a place in our high school courses. It is because of this very breadth that I urge selection and a sufficient concentration upon the part most available for educational purposes, to furnish typical ideas and basal training. I urge concentration upon the immediate environment of man and upon the processes and activities transpiring in our very presence as a groundwork and point of departure for the broader view of man's physical surroundings. The immediate environment involves an important meteorological factor, but that does not fall within my special theme. When physiography shall be developed effectively along these lines, it may very wisely, I think, replace the formal study of geology in our high schools, except in special cases where there are local or personal reasons for retaining it. For physiography taught in this vital and genetic way contains many of the most essential and fundamental elements of geology. End of section 21. Recording
by Karen. Section 22 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Relations of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current by William Libby, Jr. The problem assigned to the writer in the fall of 1888 by Colonel MacDonald, the United States Commissioner of Fish and Fisheries, was the study of the movements of the schools of fish along a portion of the Atlantic coast. These movements have been a constant puzzle to the fishermen in their efforts to follow the schools. The object of our investigation was to see if some relation could be discovered between the changes in temperature in the water and the migrations of the fish which inhabit it. Colonel MacDonald has shown that such a connection exists in his researches on the shad, and the same was found true in Professor Good's study of the Menhaden. We attempted to verify this on a larger scale and in a systematic manner. The United States Fish Commission schooner Grampus was placed at our disposal and especially equipped for the work assigned to the party. The body of water off the New England coast was chosen because it was supposed that in this region the contrast between the currents would be more distinctly shown from the fact of their being forced together by the projection of the mainland so far southward from its general curve. And this expectation was realized in the course of the work. We aimed to cover the space lying between Block Island and Nantucket, and extending southward to a distance of 150 miles from the land with a network of stations which should be 10 miles apart in all directions, and on which, at as regular intervals as possible, observations were to be made. These observations related to the temperature and specific gravity of the surface water, together with a regular hourly series of meteorological observations, and serial observations were made on the temperature of the water at each of the several stations. In the serial temperature work, the thermometers were fastened to a wire cable of 19 strands of number 24 crucible steel music wire, with a breaking strain of 1,500 pounds. The interval between the instruments varied as the depth increased. They were placed closer together where the changes were quickest, that is, near the surface and where the temperatures became more regular, they were placed further apart. We only adopted a regular system for the distribution of the thermometers along the cable after having examined the whole area to be studied from north to south along several lines, and were sure that all the facts were covered by the system. The area was studied by running out a series of lines ten miles apart, along which at intervals of ten miles the stations were made. These lines were repeated as often as possible, and temperature profile curves were plotted along these lines based on the observations made at the stations. On most of these temperature profiles, we have given the curves of 70 degrees, 60 degrees, and 50 degrees as being the most important. The 50 degree curve has been an interesting one from the beginning, as it was the means of showing us that there were two sets of conditions under which the two measurably distinct bodies of water came in contact. It will be convenient to speak of these two portions of the main current of the Gulf Stream separately. I shall therefore speak of the upper portion first. The boundary between the cold and the warm currents of the surface is very seldom a straight line, perpendicular to the surface. It marks the position of the resultant of all the forces at work. Of course, the general position of the boundary will be determined by the velocities of the two bodies and the direction of their currents when they come in contact. If we leave out of consideration the wind as an effective agent in the production and directing of the ocean currents, we find that it becomes a most potent factor in the changes which are produced in the position of this line at the surface. The winds sway the surface of these currents one way or another, sometimes for many miles, and they may retard or reinforce the currents in their flow. 
the winds which blow over this portion of the northern atlantic may for convenience be grouped in two classes one may be said to blow in a southeasterly direction and the other in a northwesterly direction the general tendency of the first group or the summer set will be to drive the warmer water at the surface over toward the coast thus forcing them above the colder waters of the labrador current the other or winter set may be considered to have the opposite effect on these waters and the final position reached after a cycle is completed will depend on the relative velocities of the winds it is not denied that there are other factors which enter into this result nor that this position is not affected by the physical characters of the waters to wit their relative temperatures densities etc but it is claimed that after due allowance for other factors the winds are the most active causes of the daily and seasonal variations which take place in this boundary while these motions may equalize one another and the resultant position remain the same from year to year it is supposable that there may be an excess in one of these directions for a series of years with the result that the boundary will be carried far inshore from its normal position and thus to a great extent obliterate the surface indications of the other current near the surface or portion here only general causes which produce and modify the currents in the oceans can produce any changes unless by the cumulative effect spoken of in the previous section modifications are brought about as a rule however the variations referred to might almost be classed as accidental because they are rarely productive of changes below twenty five fathoms when these changes are brought about they are usually of such a character as to evade detection unless the average of many observations are carefully studied when the change in the position of the resultant can be seen these two portions of the gulf stream are therefore seen to have different characters the lower one being more steady and constant is further characterized by the slight changes which take place in it the upper one on the other hand might be said to be characterized by the rapidity of its changes of position as has been said the fifty degree temperature curve is the line which bounds these two portions the shape of this curve beyond the edge of the continental platform is that of the letter s inverted the lower part of the letter represents the main body or lower portion of the gulf stream in the year eighteen eighty nine the lower portion did not touch the edge of the continental platform at any point within the area we were studying in eighteen ninety this portion of the curve touched both at block island and at nantucket in the latter part of the season and in eighteen ninety one it touched along the whole edge of the greater part of all the summer months the change which was thus produced in the temperature at the bottom along the edge of the continental platform was somewhere in the neighborhood of ten degrees an item of considerable importance the effect produced by this temperature change can be seen to best advantage by reference to the very interesting problem in biology on which it directly bears in the years eighteen eighty and eighteen eighty one a new edible fish was found in considerable numbers in the area we were studying and had attracted so much attention among fishermen that preparations were made to take it on a commercial scale for the new york and boston markets during the ensuing season unfortunately it happened however early in the summer of eighteen eighty two before the fishermen could enter upon their work that the water from cape may to nantucket in a long crescent-like curve following the continental edge was covered with the bodies of this fish dead and dying in countless millions from that time the tile fish lophilatilus gemcellion lyceps disappeared from this area entirely and attempts to find the fish since that time have been unsuccessful the subject moreover had become a sort of biologic puzzle fortunately the temperature of the water in which the fish was caught had been noted at a number of points in studying over the three sets of profiles for the three years eighteen eighty nine 
1890 and 1891, obtained from our work, I noticed the fact that there had been a progressive movement of the warm body of water toward the shore, and saw plainly that if the same rate were to hold good this year, the whole of the continental edge of the area in question would in all probability be covered by the warm water. The idea then suggested itself that if such were the case, the conditions for the reappearance of the tile fish would be established, if environment meant anything in the case. The fish had been previously in a depth of water varying from 70 to 120 fathoms, and its feeding ground being on the bottom would occur just at the edge of the platform. It was probably, moreover, a tropical deep-sea fish, and the temperature at which it was caught, 50 degrees to 58 degrees, could only be established on the New England coast by just such an invasion of the continental edge as has been described. It is only necessary to conceive that the whole of the continental edge from Florida to Nantucket is thus overflowed by this warm band of water to see how the regular feeding ground of a tropical fish could be extended so that the fish could follow it throughout the whole of this largely increased area. While in the midst of this interesting theoretic work, I was aroused by a letter from Washington from Colonel MacDonald stating that owing to an economical turn, Congress had largely reduced the appropriation for the commission, so that we should have to give up a great portion of the scientific work. I went to Washington with my facts, and they interested the commissioner to such an extent that he agreed to give me the chance to test the theory, and further expressed a wish to take part in the work himself. We first went out south of Martha Vineyard, found that the temperature was right, set the trawl lines, and caught the fish. During the next two months, I spent considerable time in tracing up the area over which the temperature of 50 degrees and over was to be found on the continental edge, fishing at the same time with the trawls to see if the fish were there. We found them all the way to the Delaware Capes, and were satisfied that though they were not numerous, they had taken advantage of changed conditions over the area to occupy an enlarged feeding ground. The explanation of the disappearance of the fish in 1882, as suggested by Colonel MacDonald, seems now to cover the ground perfectly. If we suppose this area to have been flooded by warm water in the years previous to that date, in the manner suggested above, it is easy to see that when this warm band receded, the first break in its continuity would occur in that extreme part of the bend in the coast between Cape May and Nantucket. The fish over this portion of the bottom would, in the event of the withdrawal of the warm water, be suddenly exposed to a bath of water of sufficient degree of coldness to benumb them and start them on their way to the surface. After they had reached a point in the water which marked the limit of their adjustment to water pressure, they were bound to go the rest of the way to the top, where they arrived in abnormal conditions, as their bodies were all puffed up, and in most instances their stomachs protruded from their mouths as a result of the diminution of pressure. This study of the environment of the life forms in this area has therefore led to interesting results. It is to be hoped that Congress will some day see the connection between pure and applied scientific work clearly enough to enable them to supply the means for carrying out of investigations which can lead to practical results, and that the scientific commissions of the government will not be forced to suffer through the lack of intelligent support which should be given them. End of section 22. Section 23 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. The Arid Regions of the United States. By F. H. Newell. Our honored president, in his opening address on the relations of the currents of air and water to animal and vegetal life and to the temperature of countries gave an admirable description of the interdependence of climatic forces and showed in a concise manner 
how the topography of a country modifies the character of life and through this fixes the industrial and social relations of its inhabitants. His address renders it unnecessary to discuss the causes of aridity or to more than mention the general effects. So this paper, supplementing what has been said, will dwell more upon the industrial or economic side of the matter, describing in general terms the present utilization of this vast region, much of it consisting of vacant lands. To the people of many countries as well as our own, the geography of the arid regions of the United States has a peculiar interest, owing to the fact that they include by far the greater part of the public lands upon which new homes can be freely made, either by our citizens or by foreigners intending to become citizens. These regions may be described in a general way as being in the western half of the United States, beyond the Great Plains and extending westward nearly to the Pacific coast. On the north and south they are bounded by territorial lines, the conditions of aridity prevailing in the north through Canada nearly, or quite to the Arctic Circle, and south through Mexico, until interrupted by the belt of tropical rains. Although characterized by prevailing or occasional droughts, these areas are by no means a continuous desert. On the contrary, the deserts, as the term is applied in the Old World, are comparatively rare and relatively small in extent. The arid regions may be defined as those portions of the United States where the rainfall in quantity or distribution is not favorable for the production of the ordinary cultivated food products. The limits are not easy to place, for they depend upon climatic forces which vary in intensity from year to year. That is to say, in any given locality within the arid regions, there may not be for several successive years sufficient moisture for maturing crops of grain while in the following year, rain occurring at the right time may enable a farmer to produce a heavy crop. Thus, in the latter year, these arid regions might be considered as reduced in size to be again increased as drought follows drought. It is necessary, therefore, to assume certain arbitrary boundaries based upon considerations of general success or failure of ordinary agricultural operations, insofar as they are dependent upon rainfall. For the eastern boundary, it is convenient to assume the 100th meridian west of Greenwich, although as a matter of fact, dry farming has been successfully carried on as far west as the 105th meridian, or even beyond. The western boundary is more irregular, owing to a wide difference in the topography of the country, which lies between the well-defined arid and humid areas near the Pacific coast. As laid down by Powell, on the maps of the Geological Survey, the southwestern boundary of the arid region is the Pacific Ocean up to a point on the coast of California north of Monterey Bay. From here the line turns inward across the valley of the San Joaquin, then excluding the bay counties follows northward along the western foothills of the Sierra Nevadas and the eastern slopes of the Cascade Range of Oregon and Washington in which latter state it turns eastward, excluding from the arid regions the northeastern portions of Washington and Idaho. These lines, as originally drawn, were based largely upon the assumption that 20 inches of annual rainfall were necessary for farming operations, but were modified, however, by considerations of the seasonal distribution. The lines thus laid down, although they may be criticized from various standpoints, are sufficiently exact for any general discussion, and are perhaps more useful than others drawn with greater nicety in attempting to reach higher precision. Within this great area, the extent of which is nearly half that of the United States, there is almost every variety of topography and climate, from the low sandy plains exposed to almost tropical heat, to the lofty mountain ranges with alpine snows and winds. Portions of it are as truly humid as any part of the east, but these are too small and isolated to be severally distinguished in a broad survey of the whole. Plant life is everywhere abundant, but it is of a kind strange to the eyes of the traveler from the eastern states, appearing to him sparsely distributed and partaking of the general dry, sunburned character of the landscape. The bright green of fields and trees is rarely seen in the natural conditions except after the rainy season or on the high, well-watered mountain slopes. 
During the long seasons of drought, the vegetation becomes brown and dusty, apparently dying, to revive, however, after the occasional rains. During the many years in which the population was spreading from the Atlantic coast westerly over the broad Mississippi Valley, the arid regions were regarded as of little or no value, and were left for the Indians, the wandering trapper, or prospector, and the despised Mormon. But when at last the fertile areas of the east were exhausted and places for homes must be had elsewhere, the people of the eastern part of the United States suddenly awoke to the realization that there were great resources yet to be developed within this vast extent of country. Thus, within comparatively few years, the population of the arid region has enormously increased. Every possible resource is being rapidly exploited, and the results of geographers and other investigators are being immediately acted upon to aid in pushing forward the development of this new land, which from its enormous extent promises to furnish homes for future millions. The arid regions as a whole are best known by their mineral wealth, especially of the precious metals. For many years, mining has been the principal industry, the necessary supplies being originally brought from great distances. Agriculture was then deemed not only as too slow a road to wealth, but it was even asserted that owing to drought it would be utterly impracticable. Stock raising, however, gradually encroached upon the areas hitherto regarded as deserts, the cattlemen as they were forced westward by the advance of civilization, gradually displacing the roving bands of Indians and buffaloes. A peculiar form of agriculture, looked down upon by the adventurous miners and cattlemen, had long been practiced by the Pueblo Indians and neighboring Mexicans, and to a certain extent adopted by Mormons when driven into the wilderness by their fellow Christians. This depended upon the cultivation of the soil by artificial application of water, obtained usually from a small river or creek, and conducted to the field by laboriously made ditches, often miles in length. The expense and trouble of applying water necessitated the tillage of relatively small farms, this disadvantage being compensated in part by a larger average production. Nothing could be in greater contrast to the broad cornfields of the Mississippi Valley, extending on all sides to the horizon, than the miniature gardens from which, however, came luscious fruits and extraordinary vegetables. As mines were opened and towns established, it soon became evident that in the long run the furnishing of foodstuffs and forage would be equally profitable with laboring in the mines and mills, if not more so. The methods of the Mormons and Mexicans were copied, new sources of water supply sought, ditches dug, and land brought under cultivation wherever it could be irrigated. Thus, it has resulted that within a few years, towns have sprung up in every direction, most of them dependent to a large extent upon mining, but having through practice of agriculture by irrigation capabilities of self-support and of future extension. These areas are so vast that the land irrigated or occupied by towns and mines or other industries forms but a very small percentage of the total area, most of which will still belong to the United States and is open to entry and settlement under the homestead laws. The total land area west of the 100th meridian, and excluding certain of the more humid portions of Oregon and Washington, is 1,371,960 square miles, or in round numbers, 878 million acres. Of this, about 7%, or 64 million acres, may be considered as desert, having no known value even in its minerals. A somewhat larger area, about 9%, or 83,200,000 acres, is timbered, this heavily wooded land consisting mainly of mountain slopes and plateaus. Fringing this and scattered on the hill slopes and along the streams are clumps of trees capable of yielding firewood, fence posts, etc. The aggregate area of these scantily wooded lands is estimated to be 115,200,000 acres, or a little less than 13% of the total. Deducting the aggregate acreage of desert and wooded lands, there are left about 615 million acres, the greater part of which supports a scanty herbage which either green or sun-cured is readily eaten by cattle. This may all be grouped under the head of grazing lands, 
since at one time or another of the year herds of cattle or sheep can find sustenance. Most of this latter class of land, comprising over two-thirds of the area west of the 100th meridian, has a fertile soil and climate favorable to agriculture in all respects save that of moisture. With water, great crops could be produced, but without it, nothing but the scanty native grasses succeed. The area which has actually been redeemed by irrigation is quite small, not to exceed 1%. The 11th census of the United States found that in 1889, only 3,631,381 acres were irrigated, this being but four-tenths of 1% of the entire area west of the 100th meridian. Besides the area irrigated, a relatively small area was cultivated by dry farming, the yield being, however, small. The further extension of agriculture within the arid region rests on the complete utilization of the water supply. As previously stated, the streams have been employed to a large extent, and there now remain only a few rivers from which water for irrigation is not diverted. These flow on undisturbed because of the great expense and the engineering difficulties encountered rendering doubtful the financial success of any undertaking. In the case of many of the smaller streams, the aggregate of the claims to the water exceed by far the ordinary quantity discharged, and as a result, most of the claimants must be satisfied with an amount of water less than that to which they assert ownership. At the same time, a large proportion of the water of these streams flows to waste either in floods or in winter, all of which could be used to advantage if it could be held by storage. The enormous cost of creating reservoirs for the wastewaters and the small apparent profits have to a large extent deterred private capital from entering upon such projects. The tillable lands to be benefited by water conservation or by the utilization of the larger streams not now diverted by canals are almost wholly owned or claimed by individuals or corporations so that future developments must rest most largely with these. Wise legislation will do much to aid in making feasible many great undertakings, but as a rule, it may be said that developments in this line must depend largely upon individual efforts and upon the ordinary laws of supply and demand. It has been estimated that by a complete utilization of the water supply of the arid regions, about 40 million acres can be irrigated, but allowing even that 100 million acres of the fertile grazing land can be thus redeemed, there still remain over 500 million acres, most of which, as well as the desert and timber acres, are still in the hands of the general government. The question as to the best utilization of the great body of unoccupied lands is one of immediate concern to the country at large, as well as to the inhabitants of this area. In a general way, it may be said that the more easily available resources have already been taken possession of by individuals or by associations of men, and there remain only such as were rejected or not available. Much of the best mineral land is owned by private parties, but even on the explored government land, there are probably many mines yet to be discovered. The herds of cattle have increased to such an extent that the lands, whether owned by the government or by corporations, are thoroughly grazed over, and in many localities, the herds must be fed with hay during part of the year at least. All of the water supply of the country, which can be readily diverted, is claimed or appropriated by irrigation or land companies, and almost without exception, the irrigable lands along perennial streams has passed out of the hands of the government. Still, the demand for homes continues, and settlers are from necessity forced to attempt to make a living where conditions seem to be against them. There are thousands or perhaps millions of farms which can be purchased from individuals or corporations, but the possibilities of obtaining agricultural land from the government seem to be almost exhausted. End of section 23. Section 24 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in April 2015. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, 
July 27 through 28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. Recent Explorations in Alaska by Eliza Ruama Sidmore. When the United States made purchase of Russian America by the Treaty of June 20th, 1867, there was acquired a vast empire whose shores were not even wholly surveyed or explored, whose interior was untrodden by whites, and of whose resources almost nothing was known. It had been maintained only as a fur preserve by the Russian company holding lease of the entire country. They had made no effort to explore the interior, satisfied that the natives should bring their pelts down to the coast forts. They had traced only the largest river for a few hundred miles, and the Hudson Bay Company's men had discovered its headwaters and found out that the Yukon and the Russian Kwichpak were the same. The coast range and its great peaks were only known as navigators of the Pacific had seen them, and of the interior ranges only the surveys of the Western Union Telegraph Company in 1863 through 65 had given any account. There was a considerable interest in the new territory at the time of its purchase, and Secretary Seward immediately arranged for a scientific reconnaissance in the summer of 1867 under the charge of Professor George Davidson of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey. His observations covered the coast country from Dixon entrance to Unalaska, and so much of interest resulted that the American Geographical Society of New York petitioned Congress to have a thorough survey made of the newly acquired territory. A quarter of a century has elapsed without the general government yet undertaking any systematic scheme of survey or exploration. There are no official maps of the mining regions which have been adding one million dollars in gold to the wealth of the world each year. Only the mineral laws and not the general land laws apply to the territory, which has but a skeleton form of government and no voice or representation at Washington. None can explain this neglect of and indifference to such a valuable territory, and Elysée Reclus in his Boreal America rather sharply notes that the United States considered Alaska unworthy of its attention until the pockets of its concessionaries, the Seal Island lessees, were touched. During the first ten years of military rule, 1867 to 1877, no reconnaissances or expeditions were attempted. The presence of a naval ship in southeastern Alaska for 14 years has added nothing to our geographic knowledge of the country. With the exception of the expeditions sent from the Columbia by General Miles, all exploration has been by private enterprise. Miners found their own way over to the Yukon, and their camps and communities are still without shadow of government control. Professor Meyer discovered and first reported the great glacial system as the result of his own investigations, and the National Geographic Society's two expeditions to Mount St. Elias anticipated government surveys and measurements of that cornerstone of the continent. After General Miles' summer pleasure trip to southeastern Alaska in 1882, he had some expedition to Alaska always in hand, so long as he remained at Fort Vancouver. At his instant, Lieutenant Frederick Schwatka was detailed to make a military reconnaissance of the Yukon River, following the route used by some 300 miners during the two seasons preceding his famous raft voyage. It was not discovery in any sense, as not only these miners, but the surveyors of the Western Union Telegraph Company had long preceded him, and the doctors Krause of the Berlin and Bremen Geographical Societies had but a short time before mapped the passes over the range at the head of Lynn Canal. General Miles next detailed Dr. Everett to further explore Chilcat Pass and the source of the Alsek, and dispatched Lieutenant Abercrombie to ascend Copper River, but neither expedition was fully successful. 
his detail of lieutenant henry t allen for reconnaissance of the copper river in eighteen eighty five resulted in the first discoveries and really important contribution to the geography of the country since the transfer he traversed an absolutely unknown region tracing copper river up to its headwaters and the tanana down from that same divide to the yukon and made a hasty survey and track chart of the Koyukuk River before hastening to St. Michael's. His triangulations gave the first reliable data concerning the active volcano of Mount Wrangell, whose summit is by his estimate only 17,500 instead of the fabled 28,000 feet above the sea. He accomplished all this in the face of the greatest hardships, and while the Allen expedition was the most successful and noteworthy of any thus far made in Alaska, it has been the least exploited and depreciated. Had his rivers, canyons, glaciers and great volcano been in Greenland, New Guinea or Central Africa, two continents would have applauded and bestowed medals on him. The National Geographic Society has not only equipped two expeditions to Alaska, but it claims enrolled in its membership nearly every individual who has discovered, explored, exploited, or made any special contributions to our knowledge of this farthest northwest territory. It has twice attempted to have Mount St. Elias scaled, and it may yet find the navigable channel of the Yukon, a river easily navigable for 2,000 miles, were a deep channel known through the flats that extend a hundred miles off its mouth. While ships run aground before they are within sight of land, the white whale enters the sluggish river by some deep pass and spouts for hundreds of miles up the stream. One eminent member of the society, Professor John Meyer, discovered the great bay full of tidewater glaciers at the foot of Mount Fairweather in 1879. Captain Lester Beardsley, another member, named this Glacier Bay, and furnished its first rough sketch map, and a third member, Captain James Carroll, successfully navigated it by ocean steamer in 1883, and named the Great Meyer Glacier. There has not been an actual government survey of the waters since the bay was discovered, and all charts are compiled from private sources. In 1890, Professor Harry Fielding Reed, another member of the Society, explored and mapped Meyer Glacier and its 26 tributary ice streams. In 1892, Professor Reed explored the upper end of the bay, finding and naming the Woods, Charpentier, Johns Hopkins, Rendu and Carroll Glaciers, and mapping also the Geikee, Hugh Miller and Grand Pacific Glaciers, which Professor Meyer saw from the mountain summit ten years previously. Four other members of the National Geographic Society camped at the Meyer Glacier one season, exploring the region as a hunting ground, while Professor T. J. Richardson made careful record of its landscape features in the series of ice studies and other paintings exhibited in the Alaska section of the government building at Chicago. In 1890, the late Frederick Schwatka, who had then resigned from the army, led an expedition through the British Northwest and Alaska to seek an easier route from Juneau, the mining center of Alaska, to the headwaters of Yukon River, and a new route from that region to the seacoast. His untimely end prevented his publishing the narrative of a journey as hazardous and important as any he ever attempted. He was accompanied by Dr. C. Willard Hayes of the National Geographic Society. The first half of their journey, while not over wholly unknown ground, was virtually an exploration, in that it was a practical search for and trial of a new route to the Yukon. They ascended Taku River, crossed the Cordillerian Divide, and rafted down rivers and lakes to the junction of Pelly and Lewis Rivers, which formed the Yukon. Thence, following White River to its source, they crossed the divide formed by a spur of the St. Elias Range and descended the Nitsena to Copper River, and thence to the ocean, their route describing a great arc behind the coast range and twice crossing it. 
a brief narrative with maps and descriptive text representing the scientific results of this expedition prepared by dr hayes has been published in the national geographic magazine mr e j glaive fresh from african exploration spent two seasons in exploring between the chilkat pass and the alsex mouth his later success in taking pack horses over Chilcat Pass in 1891 and finding rich pasturage for them in the bush country beyond proved the feasibility of pack trails all through those mountains. The miners have vainly urged upon the government the building of a military road across the Yukon passes, but even Mr. Glaive's demonstration of the pack horse problem does not incline that institution to heed the request of the thousand wholly ungoverned miners. There is no record that any of the navigators who sighted Mount St. Elias and made such varying estimates of its height ever made any attempt to reach it. The first known attempt to climb the great mountain was that made by Professor Charles H. Taylor of Chicago in 1877. He went out admirably equipped and accompanied by Lieutenant C. E. S. Wood of the United States Army. The refractoriness and final mutiny of their Indian canoe men after leaving Sitka prevented their scaling this keystone of the great Cordillerian arch. The unfortunate New York Times expedition, led by Lieutenant Schwatka in 1886, did not succeed in reaching even the base of the mountain. The Topham expedition, led by Messrs. Topham of the Royal Geographical Society, included also Mr. William Williams of the National Geographic Society. They were the first to stand on Mount St. Elias itself, and climbed to a height of 11,460 feet on the crumbling rim of the crater on the southern face of the mountain. Further ascent was impossible from that side, and Mr. Williams left the American flag and his tin box of records at that point in July 1888. Professor Israel C. Russell was given charge of the National Geographic Society's first expedition to Mount St. Elias in 1890. He landed in Yakutat Bay, at a point sixty miles southeast of the Great Peak, and ascending to the snow line followed the glaciers along the slope of the range to Newton Glacier, on the southeastern slope of St. Elias. He was imprisoned in his tent alone at the highest point, 9,500 feet, for two days by a heavy storm, which, covering everything with soft snow, rendered climbing impossible for the rest of the season, and made the return difficult and dangerous. In 1891 a second Mount St. Elias fund was raised by voluntary subscription within the society, and Professor Russell was again given charge. He landed at Icy Bay, forty miles directly south of the mountain, and in a measure followed the Schwatka and Topham routes to the foot of Libby Glacier. There he diverged towards the east and joined his trail of the preceding season. He followed up past magnificent ice falls and ice amphitheaters to the head of Newton Glacier and attained an elevation of 14,500 feet on the northeastern face of the mountain. From that outlook he saw for 100 miles northward myriad dark peaks pricking through the great mantle of snow and ice, and Mount St. Elias showed itself a detached peak, an abrupt spur running out from the main range of mountains. He camped at an elevation of 10,000 feet for days, waiting for the favorable day to scale the summit, but the storms continued, the provisions ran low, and they retreated from that near point when assured that all chances were against them for the season, and their strength failing from the meagre diet to which they were reduced, and continued storms that threatened their light tent. Professor Russell then made his great march across the plateau of Malaspina Glacier, which fronts the ocean for sixty miles, all the St. Elias ice streams uniting in this great ice mantle which so awed Vancouver. Captain C. L. Hooper, of the Revenue Marine Service, known to geographers by his Arctic voyages in search of the Jeannette, touched at Yakutat Bay in the autumn of 1890 to bring away the members of the Russell expedition. 
Before leaving, he attempted some independent exploration. He took his vessel through the bergs of Yakutat Bay into Disenchantment Bay, and sailed sixty miles beyond the solid wall of ice that met Malaspina a century before. Captain Hooper found there a magnificent tidewater glacier, dropping jeweled bergs into the sea from all its four-mile front of glittering ice cliffs. As a loyal member of the National Geographic Society, he named this Hubbard Glacier and its guardian peak for the president of the National Geographic Society. In 1891, Professor Russell took canoe after his exploration of Malaspina Glacier and, following the shoreline of Disenchantment Bay, went another sixty miles further than Captain Hooper had gone. He found that the bay extends as a long, narrow inlet down to a broad plain reaching to the base of Mount Fairweather, and his observations introduced many striking details into that blank space of the maps. The height of Mount St. Elias, which has been estimated all the way from 12,000 to 20,000 feet, was put at 18,000 plus or minus 100 feet by Professor Russell as the result of his triangulations from the icy bay beach. The field party of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, consisting of Messrs. Turner and McGrath, and it is unnecessary to say that they, too, are members of the National Geographic Society, devoted all of the season of 1892 to observation, and their final determination was 18,010 feet as the height of Bering's Bolshoi Sopka. Mount St. Elias still awaits its conqueror, and while the National Geographic Society retains its interest in the unscaled peak, it yields the right of way to the other societies reported as anxious to send out expeditions to it, greeting warmly even another expedition like that one from over the seas, which, learning at Sitka that there were no guides for the region, went bear hunting and then to their homes. This society has, with especial emphasis, claimed that American geographers should first consider the unknown and unexplored regions on their own continent, that American mountaineers should climb American mountains, and American geologists seek American glaciers and American volcanoes. The ascent of Mount Rainier, that isolated peak which holds a small Switzerland on its sides and promises reason for another Zermatt to grow up on its slope, has been made by only 38 people, while the records of alpine clubs tell what American climbers can do on other 14,000-foot summits in other countries. All the northwestern coast from Mount Rainier to Mount St. Elias and down the recurved shore to Unalaska offer such a field for the explorer, the mountaineer, the geologist and geographer as exists nowhere else on any continent. Only one of the eight great glaciers in Glacier Bay has been explored, mapped and measured, and not one of the trinity of great peaks that guard the bay have been trodden by white men, if ever, by a human foot. The exquisite Taku Glacier, only 18 miles by water from the largest town in Alaska, is unexplored, unmapped, unmeasured, and the world knows only the facts apparent from its beautifully sculptured front. The great glaciers in Prince William Sound, the grandest and gloomiest fjord on any coast within the temperate zone, are unnamed, unvisited, unsung. No more is known of them really than in Vancouver's day, and in that great landscape reserve of Cook Inlet, the living volcano of Iliamna has been climbed but once since the transfer. No one has ever attempted the greater volcano of Shishaldin, sloping steeply from the sea at the head of the Aleutian chain, the most exquisite uplift of earth even upon all that coast, a mountain with a more purely perfect outline than the Japanese Fujiyama. End of section 24「Section 25 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. The Caravels of Columbus by Victor Maria Concas. Invited only a few days ago to take part in this Congress as commander of the caravels, as well as a member of the Geographical Society of Madrid, I am very sorry that my address cannot be as important as the subject demands. Although I am intimately acquainted with every detail of the history of the caravels, the special mission assigned to me by the Spanish government to repeat the voyage of Columbus in the Santa Maria and the many ways in which the voyage has been described make my position the more difficult. The history and the serious representation of that great enterprise, you must admit, are very different from the many descriptions of fancy that have been written on the subject. You all know the history of the caravels of Columbus. You have heard of his troubles and difficulties, which have grown with the last four hundred years. But history, as recorded by Navarrete, whom the great Humboldt calls the father of history, says that Spain then approved generally the project, although while the conquest of Granada was hanging in the balance, the government decided to undertake no new venture until that was settled. This delay doubtless cost Columbus great sorrow, as he was growing old, but his project was not rejected by Spain. The Duke of Medina Sidonia supported Columbus during two years. The other two years, Father Diego Deza, professor at Salamanca, afterward Archbishop of Seville, supported him, and he was always protected by the Marchioness of Moya, the best friend of the Queen which proves that even if he had difficulties, he had high protectors to sympathize with and encourage him. The picture so often painted, depicting the learned men of the University of Salamanca scoffing at Columbus, conveys an erroneous idea, as the records of every meeting were kept and exist today, and nowhere can be found recorded any such action against Columbus. On the contrary, Salamanca was the scientific center of the world, and there the theory of the spherical form of the earth was sustained. Nothing is more worthy of mention, in a similar case a few years after, than when Copernicus, who was excommunicated by Rome because of his theory of the solar system, applied to that university, its learned doctors answered in this magnificent form. Read Nicolaus Copernicus. That is the best defense of that scientific center, which was for centuries the foremost in the world. You all know that Spain was consolidated by the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, sovereigns of Aragon and Castile. Portugal was almost a part of Spain, as the king had married the heiress of the throne of Spain, who unfortunately died without succession, a misfortune that will never be regretted enough by both nations. The only thing to be done by Ferdinand and Isabella to finish their great plan was to drive the Mohammedans from Granada. But that conquest was extremely difficult, as the cities when conquered were depopulated to be repopulated by the conquerors. The last bulwark of the Moors in Spain was so overpeopled by crowds ousted by the former conquests that there were millions of inhabitants disposed to fight to the last as they had only the sea behind them. So strong was the struggle on both sides that Spain, instead of keeping its soldiers in camps, built before Granada the city of Santa Fe. King Ferdinand took his residence there, making the conquest paramount to all other business. Queen Isabella, going herself several times to bring supplies to the army, put all her attention in that war, and how is it possible that any serious historian could think that under such circumstances these sovereigns, being such great politicians, could support Columbus or any other venture, whatever might have been the sorrows of the man with whom the voyage was the only thought? The best proof 
that the voyage was not forgotten is that after Granada was surrendered on January 2, 1492, the capitulations were signed on April 30. On August 3, the ships sailed from Palos, and on October 12 of the same year, Spain opened to the New World the gates of history. And tell me when, before or since, in history have events gone so quickly. Tell me why, to your great Fulton, you delayed twenty-two years to grant him in August 1807, a patent to navigate his steamer only for twelve months. Could you tell me why, in the nineteenth century, the New York legislature was obliged to threaten with prison and fine anybody that should speak or act against Fulton? Tell me, where is his family, that I suppose are very rich, according to the service of that great countryman of yours? And when those who pity Columbus so much have answered satisfactorily, we shall consider the behavior of Spain toward Columbus and his descendants, who, after four hundred years, you have seen yourselves so highly honored in this city of Chicago. As you know, the expedition of Columbus was prepared in Palos, and consisted of three ships. The largest was a vessel that was employed before in trading with Holland. She was called the Gallega, or the Galician. That name was changed to Santa Maria. The circumstance that she was chartered by the king, and that afterward, when wrecked on the coast of Santo Domingo, Spain paid for the whole ship and her equipment, has supplied much information about the Santa Maria, as all inventories and contracts made by the government exist in the archives at the present time. This permitted the new Santa Maria to be built to such a degree of exactitude that I consider at least nine-tenths an exact reproduction of the original, which certainly could not be done with other historic ships of even more recent date. It is not possible to get the same data concerning the Pinta and the Nina, as they were in fact merchant ships that went on their owner's account. There is only a memorandum of the general line of the exterior form, gear, and sails, but that circumstance proves that Columbus found welcome and help in the opinion since he was supported by regular merchants and sailors, who willingly took a part in the enterprise not only with their persons, but on their own account. These ships have been reproduced in Spain with the greatest exactitude by Lieutenant W. McCarthy Little of the United States Navy, and with the greatest skill and economy. The historical treasures which you can consult at the Convent of La Rabida in the exhibition show to the most incredulous that the spherical form of the earth was already accepted by every learned man in Europe. Even was it true to those mariners who navigated to the west as far as the Azores and Canary Islands, and it was especially so to the Portuguese, who had discovered those western islands of the group called Terceras. But only in Spain was that feeling strong and popular, a feeling that, although it was not called by the name of public opinion, as nowadays, directed the people of all nations with irresistible force. For that reason, Columbus came to Spain. For that reason, he was obliged to wait until Spain could undertake the voyage of discovery. And for that reason, he found owners of ships and rich sailors who risked willingly life and property in the enterprise. Only ignorance can see miracles and wonders instead of the natural development of facts, science, navigation, astronomy, cartography, and preparatory voyages to Africa, the Canary and Azores Islands, and Iceland. All these made ripe the fruit of crossing the ocean toward the west, and the praise belongs to the tree where that fruit was most ripe. The tree was Spain where Columbus brought the fortunate error of Toscanelli, believing the distance about one-fourth of what it is. He expected to arrive at Cathay, and so the discovery was made by Spain, and could not have been done by any other nation without committing providence to historical injustice. But when we speak of La Rabida, 
allow me to tell you how much you are indebted to Mr. Curtis for that wonder. Let me call it a wonder, for the work could not have been better done. It is not a copy. It is the same, stone by stone, the original building of La Rabida. The great discovery was not appreciated in all its importance until twenty years after, when more and more new lands and great empires were explored, and the voyage of the Victoria, commanded by Sebastian Elcano, went around the world, and whose family yet used for a coat of arms a globe with a lem primus me circum de disti. All that made us think what Spain had in her hand. In behalf of that opinion, I am going to quote the Provenza of 1513 and 1515 in the lawsuit against Diego Colon, son of the Admiral, Volume 3 of Navarrete, page 538, Documents of my private library, but I offer them with pleasure to the members of the Congress who wish to consult them. Those Provenzas that today would be called inquests were to clear up the particulars of the discovery, and there were heard more than fifty witnesses, some speaking of what they had seen, others of what they had heard from this same Columbus. Among other curious details, it is perfectly proved that Columbus contracted with Martin Alonso Pinzon, captain of the Pinta, to divide with him in equal parts honors and profits if they succeeded which contract he afterward did not fulfill, because it was not in writing. Let us forget and forgive the man, and always think of the hero. But I will finish to explain why there do not exist so many details of the caravels Pinta and Nina as of the Santa Maria. This is because the smaller ships were in their owners' or captains' hands. They did not enter into the contracts and inventories of the admiral. The three vessels being ready, they sailed from Palos on August 3, arrived at the Canary Islands on August 9, and remained there until September 6, and did not sail from Gomera, an island south of Tenerite. The instruments that they used in navigation were similar to those you see on this table. The astrolabe, well known in Spain since the 11th century. The Jacob Staff that instrument that proceeds from the Chaldeans. And I offer besides for your inspection these others, which are not copies, but real instruments that have been used at sea and that belong to the Spanish section of the exposition, and I am now to describe to you briefly the use of them. The description followed. The voyage of the caravels was made by the parallel of 27 degrees through the trade winds that, as we know today, come more to the north in summer, in which season the voyage was undertaken. You know how the deviation of the compass was discovered by Columbus, and how skillfully he overcame the difficulty between his men, changing the card on the needle as much as was necessary to correct the difference. You know also the history of the mutiny, made conspicuous by many curious pictures, one of which you can see in La Rabida, where Columbus is menaced by poniards during his sleep. Read the magnificent inquests, Numbers 15, 16, and 17, Diplomatic Collection, pages 565 to 567, where you will see that Columbus consulted Martin Pinzon about returning to Spain that night, and that Pinzon answered, No, sir, God would never allow a fleet of such a great king to return not only tonight, but not for a year. Page 566 To which Columbus answered, Let you be the blessed of God. How could it be otherwise in a short voyage of thirty days, that the only thing that made them uneasy was the steadiness of the wind, since it is the only thing referred to in the Admiral's log of the 22nd of September, when he says that he was very happy at having a headwind? as the sailors were uneasy at the steadiness of the direction of the wind. Neither was that of the greatest importance, as they had only sixteen days of voyage. Land was sighted on October 12, 
and there we again meet the man Columbus. Land was seen by a sailor of the Caravel Pinta, called Rodrigo de Triana, at two o'clock in the night, but the admiral awarded to himself the prize, consisting of an amount of money and a pension for life, because he said he had seen a light at ten o'clock. According to his own log, Thursday, October 11, they were sailing at the rate of twelve miles an hour, or nine knots of the actual measure, and how on a stormy night was it possible that he could see a light thirty-six knots distant on a low sandy inland that scarcely could be seen from the deck at five or six knots on a clear day. Rodrigo de Triana abandoned Spain in despair and made himself a Mohammedan, and Columbus received the prize allowed to him who first saw land. Let us again forget the man, to admire always the hero of an idea. But if you would read the original letter of Columbus to the nurse of the Infanta Doña Juana, which you can see also in the exposition at La Rabida, you will see that Columbus himself, by his own handwriting, states that he had money enough, although he had been five years without paying anybody. And after that study, you will be able to appreciate how much value there is in those ridiculous stories and paintings of chains and poniards of authors and artists who otherwise could not sell their works. I do not excuse Bobadilla, who was very tyrannical, even in those times, in all the nations of Europe. But all that exalts more and more the behavior of Ferdinand and Isabella, who forgot the man to re-establish immediately the hero the great discoverer, in all his privileges as general governor and admiral of the lands he discovered. And even today, in the more cultured and more enlightened nation in the world, and under very similar circumstances, although we know what the Suez Canal is for navigation, and that in the time of Ferdinand and Isabella nobody knew what was discovered, yet even now Juliceps has found one hundred Bobadillas. How then can you wonder that Columbus should find one? And where are the Ferdinands and Isabellas of the nineteenth century to forget the man and only remember the hero of another idea that opened a thoroughfare for six hundred millions of men? After that, tell me where is a nation in the world that should dare to throw the first stone at Spain of the fifteenth century? On that twelfth of October, Columbus planted on this continent a flag in the first island discovered, quite like the one which I offer for your inspection. It was the distinguishing signal of his authority, the admiral's flag. The Pinzon brothers carried these others. These are the flags of the discovery, granted by the king to the enterprise. The true flags of America, planted on the shores by the captains of the Pinta and Nina. The usual pictures are not in accord with the historical truth, since the flags were similar to the flags you can see here, and there was no priest with the party on either of the caravels, although you always see one represented in the pictures of the landing of Columbus. A great day was the 12th of October, a day that placed the name of Columbus and the flag of Castile in the Book of Immortality a great day that opened this immense continent to Europe, already threatened by reform under the weight of religious intolerance. A great day that won, when the gun of the Pinta proclaimed, Land! The cry answered from the tops of the Andes and the Rocky Mountains. For the white man! The Spanish government, wishing to renew that memory, offered again to the wind the old flag of Castile and another Santa Maria, the facsimile of the caravel of Columbus. A kind providence has permitted me to complete such a historical voyage and to cross the Atlantic in thirty-six days, the same time that the great admiral employed in crossing it, and after reaching the island where was the first European settlement, and after at Havana, Saluting the tomb where are the remains of that great hero of science and perseverance, I have brought the memory of his immortal spirit and the order of all Spain to wish from the high deck of the Santa Maria peace and prosperity 
to all the countries of the New World. End of section 25「Section 26 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses in the Wake of Columbus by Frederick A. Ober. I have selected as the subject of this paper that of a work recently published by me, entitled In the Wake of Columbus. Certain friends have rather cruelly suggested that it might better be called At the Wake of Columbus, since the subject has been a long time dead and it is high time he was buried. But Ignoring their evident flippancy, we shall, with your permission, follow a while in the wake of the great navigator, and inquire if there are any remaining evidences of his voyages and of his discoveries in the land he was the means of bringing to the notice of Europe. The fact that several towns and cities claim the honor of his birthplace, and two islands possess his last and only remains, should not deter the investigator since there are places identified with his career that are well authenticated. Leaving the somewhat mythical events of Columbus' youth and early manhood to the historian, we will glance at those places that stand forth most conspicuously, particularly in Spain and the New World. Summoning before us the picture of those times, when occurred the events that shaped the beginnings of American history, I suppose there is not one so well defined as the siege of Granada, when, after years of fighting, the Spaniards had at last reduced the Moors to the last extremity, had cooped them up in the fortress of the Alhambra, and had seated themselves before the city of Granada, determined to drive them from this their last stronghold in Europe. That they succeeded we know, and that it was at the termination of the siege, when Boabdil, the last of the Moors, had surrendered the keys of Granada, that Columbus appeared upon the scene is a matter of history. It was in April 1491 that the armies of Ferdinand and Isabella, 50,000 strong, entered the Vega of Granada and entrenched themselves upon the site of the present city of Santa Fe, building there a camp that eventually became a city. Here Columbus found them in January 1492 and here he made his last plea for his projected voyages. Disappointed, he left the fortified camp of Santa Fe and departed toward the coast of Spain, all his years of attendance on the court having apparently been passed in vain. Fate or fortune took him to the convent of La Rabida, on the coast, near the important town of Huelva, and here he met and conversed with the prior, who, formerly confessor to Isabella, retained Columbus at the convent until he himself had seen her and obtained her sanction to his return. The result the world knows. The capitulation between Columbus and the sovereigns of Spain was signed April 17, 1492, and the Genoese returned to La Rabida and Palos, where he completed his preparations for the voyage, sailing in August to the discovery of the new world. With all this, of course, everyone is familiar, but with the places most closely identified with the life and career of Columbus, and particularly in the hemisphere he discovered, very few people now living are acquainted. After more than two months of sailing, or about October 12, Columbus found himself at the new world's portal at the gateway to the unknown lands beyond. This island, the Guanahani of the natives, called by the sailor San Salvador, the landfall of the first voyage, has been variously located in different portions of the Bahaman chain. We for a long time accepted the statement of Irving that it was that now known as Cat Island, 
an opinion in which Humboldt coincided. But later investigators have assigned it to Watling's Island, most of them agreeing on it who have given the matter much attention. Of one thing we are sure, that it was an island in the Bahamas, and about midway the chain, though islands so far apart as Grand Turks and Cat, with three hundred miles between them, have been claimed as the landfall. It is unfortunate that the Journal of Columbus, which was doubtless written on the voyage and in detail, is lost, since that might have settled all doubts on this as on many other points. But, in view of what has been published, and after a careful sifting of all available evidence, I think we may assume it to have been Watling's. All the evidence and careful descriptions of the island I have given in my recently published book, In the Wake of Columbus, to which I must refer any one for further particulars. Having followed Columbus throughout Spain over five years ago, and having been commissioned by the exposition to investigate the route of the navigator through the West Indies, as well as to search out all existing remains of his settlements and plantations, when in those islands as a special commissioner during the past two years, I can claim to have given the matter some attention. Accepting the courses of the first voyage across the Atlantic as worked out by eminent navigators of modern times, we bring Columbus, at least approximately, to an island midway the Bahama chain. He lay too, outside the reefs, and landed in his small boats, finding an island, described as nearly as possible in his own words from the diary of Colon, transcribed from his journal by Las Casas, large and very level, with a large lagoon in the middle, without any mountain, and covered with verdure. The journal also describes the great barrier reef of coral that surrounds the island, and within which the water is, as still as a well, as Columbus himself says. Now, the distinctive feature of this island and this description is the great lagoon in the center of the island, a feature possessed by no other in the chain except a crooked island, which has never been claimed as that of the landfall. Cat Island has no such body of water, and in no respect does it answer the description as given by the admiral. It should be observed that the only weak link in the chain of evidence in favor of Watlings is the fact that there are no other islands of any size visible from any portion of it as mentioned by Columbus. But this may not be an objection, for he may have seen distant portions of the same island and taken them for different isles and islets. The island itself is about 12 miles long by from 5 to 7 broad, with great saltwater lagoons in the center, egg-shaped, and almost entirely surrounded with dangerous coral reefs. Like all the Bahama Islands, it is composed of limestone, with a very scant covering of soil. In fact, the rocks are almost denuded of vegetal covering, and that little of the poorest and thinnest. Still the natives have their farms, as they call them, from which they gain the scantiest subsistence. At the time of my visit a year ago, they were on the verge of starvation. The particular spot at which it is thought Columbus and his crew landed on that memorable October morning, 1492, is on the northeastern coast of Watling's Island at the end of a bay now known as Green's Harbor. From the lighthouse, half a mile distant, the whole coast is visible, and the beautiful beach lies before you, a stretch of silver sands some two miles long, terminated by promontories of coral and bordered by a low growth of sea grape, dwarf palmetto, and sweet-smelling shrubs, such as the southern coast of Florida yields. Near the southeastern extremity of this beach, where the coral rock of the headland juts out toward the barrier reefs, it is assumed that the famous landing took place, but the spot is as desolate now as at that time, four hundred years ago, no sounds breaking the stillness 
except the murmur of the waves and the cries of seabirds. On the promontory there stands a monument, erected by the correspondent of the Chicago Herald in 1891, who arrived at the conclusion, after careful examination, that this was the landing place. Regarding the natives found in possession by Columbus, we can only say that they have long since disappeared. It was during the first century of Spanish occupation that their extermination was brought about through deportation to Haiti to labor in the mines. Columbus describes them well, and also the few articles of domestic use they had in their possession, as well as the flocks of parrots and the animals of the island. Parrots are no longer found here, but are still seen in flocks on Acklin's Island, a hundred miles or so away. The only relics of the aborigines I succeeded in finding were the stone implements they used in their agricultural operations, such as salts, locally known as thunderbolts, a few bones, and a skull. All these are shown in the monastery of La Rabida, that most interesting building erected at the exposition, through the recommendation and efforts of Mr. W. E. Curtis, and which contains also other invaluable relics of the great discoverer, presenting an epitome of American history. The present inhabitants of Watlings are mostly black and colored, some seven hundred in number, and have no knowledge of the history of the island at all. Their historical lore is limited to the times of the wreckers, and their information respecting Columbus may be summed up in the query of the old Negro, who took me across from Fortune to Watlings. Say, boss, who this old man Columbia is so anxious about? Here I's been sailing these Bahama Islands more than forty year, and I is never seen him yet. They declare that the relics of the Indian are, sure enough, thunderbolts, and that they came down from the sky. One old black man solemnly assured me that he himself saw a salt descend, strike a tree and split it, and that he picked it up at the roots of the tree, after the lightning gone past by. The name of Thunderbolt is universal, as applied to these objects, throughout the West Indies. In the Spanish island they are known as Piedras de Raya, and the present descendants of the Caribs call them by that name. But we will not leave Columbus at Watlings. He sailed thence over to Rum Cay, after that to Long Island, which he called Fernandina, and then to the present Fortune and Crooked Islands, the former of which he called Isabella. The island first discovered by Columbus is very little visited and is difficult of access. Having come up toward it from Haiti, and having been dropped from the steamer at Fortune, only one hundred miles away, I was ten days in the latter island before I could get taken across to Watlings. Respecting the delights of travel in the Bahamas during the summer time, with the thermometer away up in the nineties, no means of communication except dirty turtlers, manned and officered by black men, and no shade all day save the shadow of the main room, I will have nothing to say except that I do not want to repeat the experience. From Isabella or Fortune Island, Columbus sailed southwestward toward a land the natives told him of and which they called Cuba. His first landing there was at or near the present port of Gibara, on the northern coast of Cuba, and thence he sailed eastward, entering the harbor of Baracoa, rounding the cape known as Point Maisi, and discovering another large island to the southward that of Haiti. He first saw this new island on December 5, arrived at Point St. Nicholas, recently a subject of dispute between Haiti and this government, on the 7th, and coasted until the 24th. It was on that date, after leisurely examining the various beautiful harbors encountered and trafficking with the natives, that the fleet of Columbus first met with disaster. On Christmas Eve, the Santa Maria ran on a reef and was wrecked, proving a total loss. The first Christmas in the New World was a sad one for Columbus and his sailors, 
but their distress was somewhat alleviated by the good offices of the Indian cacique, Wakanagari, whom they were seeking at the time of the wreck. He sent out canoes to assist them, and took them to his village, Guarico, where they were hospitably entertained. Near this place Columbus erected a fort, which he called Navidad, or the Nativity, in commemoration of the day of disaster, and then, leaving here a garrison of forty men, sailed beyond as far as the Bay of Samana, whence he took his departure for Spain. The places discovered by him after the first landfall are easily identified, as are all the important settlements made during subsequent voyages. Returning to America on his second voyage, Columbus found land at a point farther south than on the first, sighting the mountains of Dominica and landing at Guadalupe. I was at the landing place in Guadalupe a little over a year ago, and saw the bay in which the vessels lay while their crews were exploring the woods, when they made their first acquaintance with the cannibals. The second landfall is a quiet and peaceful country, now the center of the sugar industry of Guadalupe. But the general features of the country are unchanged, and the great waterfall, so grand and impressive, and which was described by Columbus, may still be seen, to use his own expressive language, dropping from the clouds that drift around the brow of the volcano. In Dominica, across the channel, still live the descendants of the veritable Caribs found by Columbus, and who for many years held the Spaniards at a distance. In this island and in that of St. Vincent, beside the only Indians remaining in the West Indies, of the estimated millions found here at the coming of the Spaniards. I myself have lived with them, have hunted with them for months, have studied and photographed them, and willingly testify to their many admirable qualities. Now reduced a few hundred in number, yet the Caribs formerly occupied all the islands of the West Indies south of Puerto Rico, and were a constant menace to the more peaceful Indians of the greater Antilles. Coasting northward, Columbus brought to view all those beautiful islands between Guadalupe and Santo Domingo, and finally arrived off the scene of his wreck and the site of the fort he had erected. It was night, and all was still as death. The Spaniards fired a gun, but there was no response, and in the morning they discovered that the fort had been destroyed and the garrison massacred. Not a man survived, and not a timber or gun has been found since to indicate the site of the ill-fated Navidad. But I secured one relic two years ago that without doubt once belonged to the Santa Maria, and which was once within the fort. I visited the coast of Haiti twice, and during my first visit to the island secured evidence of the existence there of an anchor of the caravel, which was in the possession of a black man near Cape Haitian. By a chain of evidence that led back to the time of the wreck and established beyond a doubt the authenticity of the anchor in question, I have shown that this relic is genuine. After a great deal of trouble, and after a contest with the black man aforementioned, I secured this anchor, and it is now in the monastery of La Rabida. This anchor is especially noteworthy, as it is the only authenticated relic we possess of the first settlement in the New World, that of Navidad. Of the second attempt at settlement, made immediately after, I secured many minor objects, which are also in La Rabida. It was in December 1493 that the first town was founded, and it was soon after the discovery of the massacre at Navidad. At Isabella, as this settlement was called, there were erected but four or five structures that were intended to be permanent, and the houses of the rank and file of the army have long since disappeared. Of the few houses that were built of stone, some traces still remain, and when I went to Isabella two years ago, I found some hewn stones and tiles, but these were all that remained of the town founded by Columbus four hundred years ago. 
though I stayed there a week and persistently hunted, I found only the few stones you may now see in the monastery, not even the ghosts of the departed Hidalgos, who are said to walk nightly through the forest adjacent, deigned to honor me with their presence. Isabella today is in desolation, completely overgrown with rank vegetation, and with no inhabitants within the region that was settled by the Spaniards. The nearest port is that of Puerta Plata, some forty miles away, and the only means of communication with the outside world is by small sailing vessels. Although the original settlement of Isabella was soon abandoned, the early settlers made several attempts to erect forts and towns in the interior of Santo Domingo, starting out from the initial town on the coast. They soon after penetrated to Cibao, the famous gold region of the island, and there erected the fortress of Santo Tomas de Yanico, near the headwaters of the Rio del Oro, or the river from which Columbus obtained the first gold in 1492. I myself have explored the region of Columbus, Rio del Oro, and have a nugget weighing half an ounce from the river Yanico, and also some flakes of gold, for there is yet much gold in the interior of Santo Domingo, and the region has never been fully exploited. Santo Tomas is indicated at present only by rude earthworks, but the traditions of its early days still survive and the memory of the audacious exploits of Alonso de Ojeda and the fierce Caunabo still lingers. This fortress was erected in 1494, and immediately after were started the towns of Concepcion de la Vega and Hacagua, about 1495. Both towns were destroyed by an earthquake in 1564, but from the ruins I succeeded in taking away some interesting relics which are to be seen in the monastery, and in photographing the fort and the ruins of the church. Not far from these ruins is the hill of Santo Cerro, overlooking the glorious plain called by Columbus the Vega Real, or Royal Plain, where his forces had a decisive battle with the Indians in 1495, which reduced them to subjection and sealed their fate forever. From a tree still standing on the Cerro, and called the Nispero de Colon, the discoverer watched the first important battle between red and white races, and afterward erected here a cross which was long a venerated relic. The interior of the island of Santo Domingo is little known, and my explorations there were well rewarded, so far as Colombian relics go, and I would recommend it to the adventurous traveler as an interesting field for exploitation. The Spaniards finally drifted away from the northern coast of Haiti, and the city of Santo Domingo was founded on the south in 1496, which yet contains many things that take us back to those first years of conquest. The chapel still stands, though in ruinous condition, from the porch of which Bobadilla proclaimed the downfall of Columbus, and the house built by Don Diego, the son of the admiral, rises above the right bank of Osama River. There is a castle also, the Omenage, which was built in the year 1509, or during the dominion of Don Diego. Here also are the ruins of the first American university, date 1507 or 1509, the vast convent of the Franciscans, a contemporary structure, and lastly here are some of the remains of Columbus. To be more explicit, I may say that here are to be seen one set of the remains that Columbus left behind him at his departure, the other being claimed by the city of Havana. It is too long a story to narrate. All the evidence on both sides is given in my book, and also in the monastery of La Rabida, reproduced in Jackson Park. Briefly, Columbus died at Valladolid in Spain in 1506. His remains were taken to Santo Domingo about 1540, where they were deposited at the right hand of the high altar in the cathedral, remaining there until 1795, 
when the Spaniards took up and transported what they thought were the bones of Columbus to Havana. But in 1877, in making some repairs in the cathedral, the workmen found another vault, which contained a casket and bones, also inscriptions showing that those were the real remains and that the Spaniards had made a mistake and had probably taken away the ashes of Don Diego, the son. But wherever may rest the bones of the great admiral, it is with the island of Santo Domingo that his greatest exploits are associated, and in that island he expressed the wish to be buried. Nearly every island of the Caribbean Sea has an association with the great Colon. In his second voyage he discovered the Caribbees, or Lesser Antilles. On his third he found Trinidad and the peninsula of Paria, as well as the Pearl Islands, sailing thence to Santo Domingo again, whence he was sent home in chains, in the year 1500. On his last and most disastrous voyage, 1502, and the two years succeeding, he coasted the eastern shores of Yucatan and Central America, the voyage ending at Jamaica, where all of his vessels were wrecked and where he remained a twelve-month a prisoner on his stranded ships, fighting the Indians and engaged in conflicts with his own mutinous men. The scene of his last shipwreck is well authenticated, and, as the conclusion of my labors in the search for Colombian footprints, I visited and photographed the little bay in which, for a whole year, he remained at the mercy of the sea and the savages. It is on the northern coast of Jamaica, in the parish of St. Anne's, the most beautiful portion of that beautiful island. A mile distant from the bay of St. Anne's is a little sea nook, called today Don Christopher's Cove, and on its narrow stretch of beach, with bordering fringe of sea grape and cocoa plum, Columbus stranded his vessels, building over their decks a shelter of palm thatch, and here lived for a year, as Irving says, castled in the sea. Halfway between Jamaica and Haiti is an island known as Navassa, at which the canoe sent by Columbus to Haiti for assistance touched on its way, the starving crew finding there a little raw fish and some water, which enabled them to complete their most perilous voyage. But perhaps I have followed too long after the ships of Columbus. I might mention many other spots he visited, and which I have seen but with your assent, I will bring this description to a close. End of section 26 Section 27 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago July 27 through 28, 1893 Memoirs and Addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre-Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Ellroy Curtis Part 1. Several eminent Scandinavian scholars and others who have made the early voyages of the Norsemen the subject of special study have for years contended that the archives of the Vatican contained important evidence bearing upon the pre-Columbian discoveries of America. Some have even had the courage to assert that the legends and traditions of the Icelandic sagas would be established as facts if the records of the church could be called as witnesses, while others have gone even still farther and have insisted that, through the secret aid of the Pope, Columbus enjoyed full knowledge of the voyages of the Norsemen and the country they called Vinland the Good, and simply followed the course over which they had cruised across the ocean four hundred years before his birth. 
but until Leo the Thirteenth came to the Vatican, no amount of argument or influence was able to unlock the mysterious manuscripts which for eighteen hundred years have been accumulating upon the shelves of the Holy See. Some years ago, a woman went to Congress and asked the passage of a resolution directing the President of the United States to use his influence with the Pope to have them examined, but no notice was taken of her petition, and year after year applications from students and historians were made in vain. The officers of the Church denied nothing. They simply said that they did not know what the early archives of the Church contained, that they had not been disturbed for centuries, and that no one with access to them had either the time or the disposition to make an examination. In the summer of 1892, Congress passed a resolution requesting the governments of Spain, France, Great Britain, the Pope of Rome, the Duke of Veraguas, and others to loan for exhibition in the convent of La Rabida at the World's Columbian Exposition certain manuscripts, maps, and printed volumes relating to the voyages of Columbus and the discovery and early settlement of America. It was my pleasant duty to convey this request to the nations and persons named, and with the exception of the government of France and the municipality of Genoa, the response was prompt, generous, and complete. His Eminence, Manager Rampola, Cardinal Secretary of State, who represented the Pope in the negotiations, was extremely cordial and interested, and although he could not permit any original papers to be taken from the files of the Vatican, he caused a thorough investigation to be made, and furnished a facsimile of every important or interesting document that could be found bearing upon the early history of America. While the claims of the Scandinavian scholars were not sustained, and no evidence was disclosed to show that the discoveries and adventures of the Norsemen in America were ever known to the Church, or that Columbus obtained any information or assistance whatever from this source, there were brought to light several historical documents of the greatest value, relating to the settlement of Greenland, and the propaganda of the Church in the Middle Ages. The work of investigation was done under the direction of Mr. J. C. Haywood, a ripe and skillful scholar, who has devoted many years to the study of the history and the policy of the Catholic Church, and who kindly consented to serve as the representative of the Department of State of the United States in securing a historical exhibit from the Vatican. Mr. Haywood was formerly a resident of Philadelphia, but of late years has made his home at Rome, and is one of the chamberlains of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He was inspired in his work by a double motive, the desire to have the Vatican represented at the world's Columbian Exposition by some important and unusual exhibit, and to add to the records of the Department of State at Washington a collection of most valuable historical papers. The documents were exhibited in the convent of La Rabida, at the World's Columbian Exposition, with the relics of Columbus and the catalogue of the collection contained, among much other new and interesting historical matter. The following description from Mr. Haywood's pen. The facsimile of documents relating to the early history of America here exhibited are taken from the famous series of the Papal Registers or Letter Books. These are a collection of more than 12,000 volumes in folio, partly written on parchment and partly on paper, and are preserved in the secret archives of the Holy See at the Vatican Palace. In these registers, almost all the letters issued by the popes were recorded before being sent to their destinations. They contain also the petitions received and offer, therefore, original and most important materials for the histories of all nations. The collection now begins with Pope Innocent the Third, eleven ninety eight to twelve sixteen. All the portion of it prior to that date was lost or destroyed in the commencement of the thirteenth century. What remains is classified as follows A. The Vatican Registers, over two thousand volumes, eleven ninety eight to sixteen hundred. B. The Avignon Registers, about three hundred and fifty volumes. 1316 to 1417. C. The Lateran Registers, about 2,300 volumes, 1417 to 1831. 
D. The Registers of the Requests, about 7,400 volumes, 1352 to 1831. It must cause a peculiar satisfaction to Leo the Thirteenth that one of the early results of his enlightened liberality in opening the secret archives is, as shown by these letters, to make accessible to all proofs that, by whomsoever represented, the papacy has always been faithful to the divine mission which it claims for itself, that whenever discoveries of, till then, unknown countries have been announced, it at once has made provision for the preaching of the gospel and the introduction of Christianity among the peoples of such countries. The papers, of which the facsimiles are here shown, may be divided into four groups. Those which relate to the bishopric of Garter, Greenland, those which relate to the line of demarcation, those which relate to the sending of missionaries to America, those in which Pope Julius II recommends Bartholomew and Diego Columbus. A. Documents Concerning the Bishopric of Garter, Greenland Greenland certainly is the part of the New World which was first brought into relation with the Old. This was done through the Northmen of Norway and Iceland. It was by their means that Christianity was first carried to America, and there gave occasion for the documents in question. According to Adam of Bremen, died about 1076, and the sagas, Norwegians first reached the American coast at the end of the ninth or beginning of the tenth century, but as in Norway itself, so in Greenland, the complete establishment of the Christian religion is attributed to King Olaf II, died 1030. It is said that Archbishop Aldebert of Bremen, 1055, sent Albert as the first bishop to Greenland. This bishopric certainly existed in 1124. It was the first bishopric erected in America. The numerous researchers and publications in regard to the extension of settlements which Christian Greenlanders effected on the American continent, and in regard to the positions of the Helleland, the Markland, and the Vinland, make apparent not only the possibility, but also the probability, that a considerable portion of that continent felt in some degree at that time the civilizing influence of the bishops of Garter. Raffin identified the Vindland with Massachusetts. The question has lately been thoroughly re-examined by Storm. His opinion is that Vindland, and consequently the extreme point reached by Christian Northmen, cannot be sought for further south than Nova Scotia. In any case, the historic importance of the bishopric of Garter is plain. The bishopric belonged to the first metropolitan see of Hamburg-Bremen, but in 1146 Pope Eugene III sent the cardinal bishop of Albano Nicholas, who afterward became Pope Hadrian IV, to Norway to arrange in a more convenient manner the ecclesiastical affairs of that country. He established a metropolis see at Drontheim, to which he subjected the bishoprics of Norway, of the Northern Islands, and of Garter, or Greenland. The letter of Innocent the Third, the earliest in order of time and the first here exhibited, epitomizes the apostolic case with which his predecessors in the twelfth century had bestowed on only part of America then known. In all ordinary matters the dioceses were governed by the bishops, without any direct interference on the part of the Pope. But when Gregory the Tenth, in the Council of Leons, eleven seventy four, ordered that a tithe of all ecclesiastical revenues should for six years be contributed, in order to provide means at least to preserve the last Christian position in Palestine, which after the death of Louis the Ninth of France, died August the 25th, 1270, seemed almost lost, and some interferences in some cases became necessary. The letters of the popes, written under these extraordinary circumstances to the Archbishop of Trondheim, contain interesting information regarding the condition of the Greenlanders in the 13th century, and show that a part of America helped to furnish the money for the crusade. The archbishop has informed the Pope, letters 2 and 6, that it would take him five years, including the voyage to and from, to visit the diocese of Greenland, and has asked permission to send some proper person in his place. Other letters, 3 and 4, 
say that the archbishop would have to spend six years in order to collect personally the tithes in his archdiocese, and that in doing so he would be obliged to live, sometimes five or more consecutive days, in a tent while traveling through desert regions. Therefore he thinks it needful that a large number of collectors should be appointed. In other letters, five and eight, the archbishop notes the poverty of the country. The people had no money of any kind, and no grain or fruit could be grown. The inhabitants lived on milk or food produced from it, laticenia, and fish. In Greenland, particularly the people could offer nothing for the expenses of the crusade but skins, probably of the elk or of the musk ox, and of seals, coria bovina et focarum, and the teeth and soper of whales, funes balanerum. The non-production of grain and grapes made it necessary for the faithful, letter 7, to provide for a supply of bread and wine to be used in celebrating the Eucharist. From a letter of Pope Nicholas V, dated September 22, 1148, letter 9, it appears that the Greenlanders attributed their conversion to St. Olaf, King of Norway, died 1030, that they had built, beside a goodly number of parish churches, a respectable cathedral at Garter, and about the year 1418 heathen foreigners, with a fleet, invaded their country, killed or carried into slavery the inhabitants, and burned their habitations and buildings, leaving only nine churches, which were in the least accessible regions. Some of the captives, having escaped and returned to their own country, unable to go to the distant churches, have begged the Pope to provide them with priests and a bishop. Nicholas therefore empowers the two neighboring bishops of Iceland to satisfy the pious desires of the Greenlanders. The information contained in this letter of Nicholas V is in some measure completed and confirmed by one from Pope Alexander VI, written 1492-93, to just when Columbus had made his great discovery. It seems that the letter of Nicholas did not reach its destination, or failed to effect its purpose. At any rate, the Greenlanders had addressed a petition to Innocent the Eighth, setting forth that, for about eighty years, since the heathen invasion in about 1418, they had been deprived of priests and of a bishop. As a consequence, many had already lost their faith, and to those who remained faithful, the only memorial of Christian worship yet belonging was the caporal, on which, nearly one hundred years before, a priest had, for the last time among them, consecrated the blessed sacrament. Once every year this holy and venerated relic was shown to all the people. Before his elevation to the pontificate, Alexander, as chancellor, had proposed Matthew, a Benedictine monk, for the bishop of Garter. By this letter he frees him from the payment of all the fees that were due in such cases, and praises the willingness with which he had undertaken the difficult mission. Documents that relate to the line of demarcation. Acting on the approved general opinion, a common consent of the time, which acknowledged the right of popes to interfere authoritatively even in political and international affairs, when the welfare of souls are involved, the Portuguese kings, with their discoveries along the western coast of Africa, commenced a series of demands for the exclusive right of discovery and colonization in that direction. This the popes Martin V, Eugene IV, Nicholas V, and Sextus IV gradually ceded to them till their successive grants covered all the region from Ceuta, around Africa, to India. The discovery announced by Columbus, and believed even by himself till the day of his death, to be only a new and shorter way to the eastern part of India, naturally excited the apprehensions and jealousy of the Portuguese court. On the return of the great discoverer, March the 4th, 1493, from his first voyage, Ferdinand put in operation all his diplomacy at Lisbon, for the purpose of preventing any interference with his claims, and at Rome, in order to procure from the Pope a sole proprietorship of the New World, he obtained three papal letters, dated May the 3rd and 4th, which was to effect this result. The letter beginning, etc., of the date of May the 3rd, gave to Spain, 
first the exclusive right to the lately discovered islands, and to the other lands which might still be found, so far as they were not already possessed by some Christian power. Secondly, the same privileges and rights for its new colonies as those previously conceded to Portugal for its possessions on the west coast of Africa. The other letter, of same date, which begins, Eximie Devotionis, contains only the last-mentioned concession. The third letter, dated May the 4th, on the other hand, gives the first concession indicated above, but not the second, and is therefore to some extent a repetition of the first letter. But it contains, in addition, a definition of the famous line of demarcation, determining more exactly the donation given by the first letter, evidently on account of the grant made to Portugal, although that is not mentioned. The line is fixed one hundred leagues to the west and south of the westernmost islands of the Azores. To the south was added because the region was particularly desired by both parties, and because Portugal had already proposed the drawing of a line from east to west in order to confine Spain to the northern side of such a boundary. The condition of geographical science at the time did not permit the intended boundary to be defined more accurately. In proposing it to Alexander the Sixth, Spain only knew that it would fall far from San Salvador and hoped that, by keeping its ships at a distance of one hundred leagues from the most western of the Portuguese possessions, alarm and jealousy on the part of the last-named power might be prevented. But Portugal, like Columbus and Spain, believed San Salvador to be part of India, to which country, passing the Cape of Good Hope in 1487, it had opened a new way, and to which it claimed the exclusive right. It was therefore impossible for Spain to maintain the demarcation line of Alexander the Sixth, and in the convention of Todarias, the 7th of June, 1494, it was moved, 170 leagues farther west, a change which, without the cognizance of either party, gave Brazil to Portugal. But although the position of the demarcation line of Alexander the Sixth had been changed, it continued, nevertheless, to be the basis of all subsequent transactions and conventions for dividing the sovereignty of the New World, and thus preserved peace between the two colonizing powers. It is clear from the text of these letters that the popes, and especially Alexander the Sixth, found such action, as was his in this case, on their duty to provide for the Christianization of the new countries a duty which carried with it the right and authority to use all power, and particularly all indispensable means for its accomplishment. The conversion of these heathen populations seemed impossible, unless somehow they should be incorporated into and peace preserved between the Christian kingdoms of Spain and Portugal. The Sending of Bishops and Missionaries to the New World In these grants of lands newly discovered, or to be discovered, Alexander the Sixth and his predecessors emphatically insisted on the duty of Christian kings to cooperate, by all means under their control, in the conversion of the inhabitants of such lands. In fact, such cooperation was clearly an implied condition and consideration of the grants. The evidence appears insufficient to support a positive assertion that on his first voyage Columbus was accompanied by a priest but it is a plain fact that for the second expedition in fourteen ninety three ferdinand and isabella as well as alexander the sixth solicitously provided missionaries not only for the spiritual well-being of the spaniards but also and principally for the conversion of the natives bernard boyle greatly esteemed for his saintly life and for his great ability in the management of ecclesiastical and also of political affairs offered himself for this mission the first apostle who, after Columbus's discovery, went to the New World. Till 1492 he was a Benedictine monk, or hermit, at Montserrat. But at the time of his mission to the lately discovered islands, that is to say, at least from September 22, 1492, to December 8, 1497, he belonged to the order of the Menimi, which shortly before had been established by St. Francis of Paul. In 1488 he returned to the Benedictine order and became abbot of Cuxa. The copyist of the letter to Alexander IV to Boyle, 
made, therefore, a very excusable mistake in writing Minorum instead of Minimorum, in consequence of which Regnaldus, Wadding, and many other writers assigned Boyle to the Franciscan order. By this letter of June the 25th, 1493, Alexander granted to Boyle and his twelve companions all the powers and privileges which could aid to make their enterprise successful. Of these twelve companions, only Pedro de Asena and Fray Jorge are named. Pedro de Asena is said to have celebrated the first mass in the New World after it was discovered by Columbus. As early as 1501, at the request of Ferdinand and Isabella, Alexander took steps to provide bishops for the infant colonies in America. In 1504, an archbishopric and two bishoprics were erected at Tagusta, Magua, and Bayuna in Hispaniola, Haiti. But through the operations of Ferdinand's well-known financial policy, the plan came to nothing. On August 8, 1511, these three dioceses were suppressed, and three others were established at Santo Domingo and Concepcion de la Vega in Hispaniola, and at San Juan in Puerto Rico, and placed under jurisdiction of the archbishops of Seville, where the government of the colonies had its seat. In August and September of 1513, see five letters of that date, John of Quevedo, a Franciscan friar, was appointed to the see of Banta Maria de Antigua, or Darien, and his appointment announced to the authorities and people. He was the first bishop of a diocese on the American continent. He died at Barcelona about December 5, 1520. Already a considerable body of priests, both secular and regular, were working for the religious good of the colonists and to convert the natives. The popes, however, and the rulers of Spain wished to increase the number of these laborers and to provide for their government. A letter of Clement VII, dated June the 7th, 1526, letter 22, the better to effect their wish, urged the general of the Franciscans to visit personally the members of his order in the New World. By another letter, letter 23, Clement authorized the emperor, Charles V, who had asked for missionaries to send 120 Franciscans, 70 Dominicans, and 10 Sergomites to the lately discovered islands, even without the permission of their respective superiors, granting to those who should be sent many privileges and exemptions. With like solicitude, the kings of Spain and Portugal continued to fulfill the condition under which they had received the papal grants of newly discovered or to be discovered territories. Pope Julius II recommends Bartholomew and Diego Columbus to the King of Spain. On the death of Christopher Columbus, May the 20th, 1506, began for his heirs the difficulties which, aggregated by the characteristic tenacity of the family, occasioned the endless lawsuit, well known as Los Pletos de Colón. With the hope of ending these difficulties, Bartholomew, the brother, and Diego, the son of the discoverer, determined to join King Ferdinand, then at Naples. Passing through Rome, on their way thither, they were kindly received by Pope Julius II, and obtained from him a recommendation to Ferdinand, who seems already to have been favorably disposed toward them. End of section 27section twenty eight of the national geographic magazine volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org proceedings of the international geographic conference in chicago july twenty seventh through the twenty eighth eighteen ninety three memoirs and addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre-Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Elroy Curtis Part 2 The documents from the secret archives of the Vatican, of which facsimiles were furnished by Cardinal Rampola, for exhibition in the monastery at La Rabida, are as follows. 1. 985 
Letter of Pope Innocent III, dated February 13, 1206, to the Archbishop of Drontheim, confirming his metropolitan rights over the Diocese of Greenland, which had been established by Pope Eugene III in 1148. Translation Innocent III to the Archbishop of Drontheim, and his canonically appointed successors in perpetuity. Although the power of binding and loosing was given to all, although one and the same command of preaching the gospel to every creature was given to all, nevertheless a certain distinction of dignity was decreed, and one alone received above all the rest the care of the Lord's sheep, according to the Lord's words, Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. It was Peter, likewise, who obtained the preeminence among all the apostles. He who received a special command from the Lord to confirm his brethren, in order that posterity might thereby understand that though many should be ordained to govern the church, one alone was to hold the supreme dignity, one alone was to be over all the rest in authority and jurisdiction. Hence, and in accordance with this design, a distinction of dignities is observed in the church, and just as in the human body the different members thereof are destined for different purposes, so also in the church different persons receive different orders for different ministries, for some are ordained for special churches, some for the government of different cities, and the settlement of different affairs, others are set over special provinces, others have jurisdiction over their brethren for the trial of cases pertaining to their subjects. Over all these, however, the Roman pontiff, like Noah in the ark, is recognized as holding the first place, for he, by virtue of the privilege granted him from on high, in the person of the prince of the apostles, judges, and settles the causes of all, and ceases not to confirm in the Christian faith the sons of the church throughout the world, rightfully endeavoring to prove that he has heard the voice of the Lord, saying, And thou being once converted, confirm thy brethren. The apostles and men who have successfully risen to the government of the apostolic see since the blessed Peter have likewise striven with unfailing zeal to accomplish the same, and either personally or by means of their legates they have endeavored to their utmost to correct whatsoever needed correction and to decree whatsoever was required. Our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Eugene, following in their footsteps, was anxious, in accordance with the duty of his office, to correct in the kingdom of Norway all that seemed to demand correction, by sowing therein the word of faith, and what he himself was unable to do, owing to his care of the universal church, he entrusted for execution to his legate Nicholas, then bishop of Albano, and later Roman pontiff, who, having gone to that country, loaned out, obediently, to the commands of his master, the talent he had received, and, like a faithful and wise servant, endeavored to derive an increase therefrom. Among other things which he there accomplished to the glory of God's name and the credit of his ministry, according as he had been commanded by our aforesaid predecessor, he bestowed the pallium upon thy predecessor John. And lest the province of Norway should lack the supervision of a metropolitan, he designated the city of Nidris, now under thy charge, as the metropolitan see in perpetuity of the said province, and gave it as suffrage sees in perpetuity. Aslo, Amatrip, Bargen, Thvrangi, and Orkney, Faroe, and Subrai Islands, Iceland, and Greenland, ordering the bishops of the same to obey him and his successors as their metropolitans. Lest, therefore, any one should ever presume to violate the order of the aforesaid legate, we, after the example of the above-mentioned Eugene, of happy memory, of Alexander and of Clement, our predecessors, and Roman pontiffs, confirm the same order by apostolic authority, and by the present ordinance decreeing that, in the city of Nidris, it is to be forever regarded as the metropolitan see of the above-mentioned cities, that their bishops are to obey thee and thy successors as their metropolitan, and to receive from your hands the grace of consecration, that thy successors, however, are to come to the Roman pontiff alone, in order to receive the gift of consecration. 
and that they are to be subject to the Roman Church alone. Moreover, thy fraternity will use the pallium, which has been given thee, the emblem of the plenitude of the pontifical office, within church only during the solemn celebration of Mass, throughout thy entire province, and on those days only which are written below, viz. the Lord's Nativity, the Epiphany, the Lord's Supper, the Resurrection, Ascension, and Pentecost, on the festivals of the Blessed Mother of God, Mary, Ever Virgin, the Feasts of St. Peter and Paul, the Finding and Exaltation of the Holy Cross, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, the Feast of the Blessed John the Evangelist, on the commemoration of all saints when consecrating churches or bishops, blessing abbots or ordaining priests, on the anniversary of the consecration of thine own church, the feasts of the Holy Trinity, and of St. Olaf, and the anniversary of thy consecration. Wherefore let thy fraternity perform all things with such diligence, that the ornaments of thy conduct may be in keeping with the fullness of the great dignity thou hast received. Let thy life be an example to all who are under thee, so that they may learn therefrom that they should seek after what they are obliged to shun. Be distinguished for thy prudence, chaste of thought, pure in conduct, discreet in silence, useful in speech. Seek rather to do good to men than to rule them. In thyself thou shouldest consider not the power of the order, but the equality of thy condition. Have a care lest thy life render void thy teaching, or thy teaching be in contradiction with thy conduct. Remember that the government of souls is the art of arts. Strive above all things to observe faithfully the decrees of the apostolic see, humbly obeying the same as thy mother and mistress. These, most beloved brother in Christ, are some among the many duties which pertain to thy archiepiscopal and sacerdotal office all of which thou canst easily perform with Christ's aid, provided that thou hast charity, which is the mistress of all virtues, and humility, that thou hast inwardly what thou seemest outwardly to have. Accordingly we decree, etc., unto the end. Given in Rome at St. Peter's by the hand of John, Cardinal, Deacon of St. Mary's, in Cosmodin, Chancellor of the Holy Roman Church, on the thirteenth day of February, the sixth indiction in the lord's incarnation 1205 and the eighth year of the pontificate of pope innocent the third 2 986 four letters from pope john the 21st to the archbishop of drontheim relative to the collection of tithes in greenland for the crusade dated december the 4th 1276 John the twenty first to the Archbishop of Drontheim. Having received by apostolic brief the commission to collect tithes in the kingdom of Norway for the Holy Land, and having been expressly commanded in the same brief to visit personally all the countries of the said kingdoms for this purpose, thy fraternity informs us that such visitations seem in a measure impossible, for the diocese of Gardar, which belongs to thy province and kingdom, is so far from the metropolitan sea, and the difficulties of navigation are so great, that five years are scarcely sufficient for the round journey. Hence thou hast reason to doubt whether the apostolic mandate, or thine, will reach the aforesaid country within the period named for the payment of the tithes. Accordingly, thou hast had recourse to the wisdom of the apostolic sea for a remedy in this matter. We therefore, in our desire that the collection of the said tithes be diligently attended to, do wish and by apostolic letters do command thy fraternity, the above facts being true, to appoint certain capable and faithful persons, regarding whom we charge thy conscience, who shall go to that country, and shall see to and diligently superintend the said collection. Thou shalt also zealously provide whatsoever shall seem expedient in the said matter that thou mayest obtain thy reward of the Lord, and merit for thyself more abundantly the favor of the apostolic see. Given at Verterbo, December the 4th, in the first year. To the same. Having received by apostolic brief the commission to collect tithes in the kingdom of Norway for the Holy Land, and having been expressly commanded in the same brief to visit personally all the countries of the said country for this purpose, 
Thy fraternity has informed us that several of the dioceses in that kingdom and belonging to thy province are so widely scattered over the sea and so extensive in territory that it would be difficult for thee to visit personally all the districts of the aforesaid diocese within a period of about six years and without most serious expense to thy see and since thou wouldst have to travel for some five or more seasons through countries where because there are no houses thou wouldst be compelled to carry tents thou hast asked to be authorized to depute notwithstanding the apostolic brief to the contrary certain prudent and capable commissaries to collect the tithes in the said countries wherefore in order to spare thee and thy see such expense we have concluded to grant thee by tenor of these present permission to appoint such commissaries for the collection of tithes in the said diocese in case the above be in accordance with the facts and if thou seest fit to do so regarding which we charge thy conscience we wish thee however to visit personally such of the aforesaid dioceses as thou canst without great inconvenience and to attend zealously to the collection of the said tithes in order that thou mayest expect a recompense from the lord whose work it is and mayest more abundantly merit the favour of the apostolic see given at vertibo december the fourth in the first year to the same thou hast informed us that owing to the great extent of the diocese in the kingdom of norway wherein thou hast been appointed by apostolic letter collector of tithes for the relief of the holy land the two collectors named with apostolic permission for every diocese are not sufficient for the said work nor can they attend to the matter without inconvenience and very great expense by the advice and with the assent of thy suffragans in the said kingdom thou hast appointed for the country districts of the different dioceses several other collectors who by their own efforts and at their personal expense are to collect the tithes and then consign them to the two city collectors wherefore thou hast humbly besought us to consider the labor and expense to which these country collectors put themselves and to grant them some indulgence hence as we desire that these country collectors should drive some profit from their labors and expense we grant them the indulgence which has been accorded to those who by their efforts and cooperation further the cause of the holy land given at viterbo december the fourth in the first year to the same thou hast informed us that in the kingdom of norway where thou hast been entrusted with the collection of tithes for the holy land the current coin is so base as to be of no value beyond the frontiers of the kingdom and that in certain parts of the said kingdom money is not used at all besides no crops are grown and no fruits are produced the people subsisting almost entirely upon milk cheese and fish hence thou hast humbly asked us to tell thee what thou art to do with the tithes collected of the aforesaid milk cheese fish and money accordingly in our desire that whatever is most advantageous to the work to be done in the matter we think that it would be well if the above be exact to exchange as circumstances will permit all such coin and tithes for gold or silver as for the nuns and other religious orders of the same kingdom whose incomes and ecclesiastical revenues are so small as to be inadequate for their support thou canst observe that which is more fully set forth in the declarations concerning this collection of tithes given at viterbo december the fourth in the first year number three number nine eighty seven letter from pope nicholas the third dated january thirty first twelve seventy nine to the archbishop of drontheim concerning the collection of tithes in greenland nicholas the third to his venerable brother the archbishop of drontheim we have gathered from thy letters to us that the island on which the city of gardar is situated is rarely visited by a ship because of the storminess of the ocean within which it lies hence when recently certain seamen set sail for the said island to the said city thou didst avail thyself of the opportunity to send in company with the said seamen a prudent man whom thou didst depute to collect the tithes and relying upon our approval thou didst authorize him to absolve clerics from the sentence of excommunication 
which they had incurred for not having paid the tithes within the appointed time, and to free them from whatsoever irregularity they might have contracted. Hence thou hast humbly sought us to grant our gracious ratification. Since then we cannot favorably assent to this demand, inasmuch as it is not supported by reason, and wishing on this account to accede to thy desires by applying a ready preservative against dangers to souls, we hereby authorize thee to impart to those whom thou hast sent, or whom thou wilt hereafter send, to the aforesaid islands to absolve clerics, whether in the above mentioned, or in whatsoever other islands of the same sea, from the aforesaid sentence according to the form of the church, and to dispense them from this kind of irregularity. Given in Rome, St. Peter's, January 31st, 1279. Number 4. Letter from Pope Nicholas III to Master Bertrand Arnabri, dated June the ninth, 1279, concerning the purchase of wine and altar bread for the churches in Greenland. Nicholas III to the same, Master Bertrand Amabrie. We have lately been informed by thee that certain revenues have been assigned by the piety of the faithful in the cathedral churches of Denmark and Sweden, for the special purpose of procuring wine and altar-bread for the clergy of the churches within the said kingdoms. As, however, thou hast consulted the apostolic see as to whether tithes should be taken from such revenues, we, while commending thy diligence, do by apostolic letter leave the matter to thy discretion, so that, if the revenues be so considerable that thou art certain a large sum is left over after the furnishing of wine and altar-bread, we desire that tithes be paid thereof. If, however, little or nothing remains of the said revenues, nothing is to be paid, out of reverence for worship and the sacrament of the Lord. Given in Rome at St. Peter's, June the ninth, 1279. Number 5. Number 988. Letter of Pope Martin the Fourth to the Archbishop of Drontheim, dated March the fourth, 1281 instructing him as to the skins and whalebone contributed as tithes by the people of Greenland. Martin the Fourth to the Archbishop of Drontheim. Thy fraternity has informed us that the tithes which are being paid in the Iceland and the Faroe Islands in the Kingdom of Norway consist of various articles which cannot easily be exchanged or sold, on which account the same cannot well be sent to the Holy Land or the Apostolic See. Thou hast added, moreover, that the only tithes which can be collected in Greenland consist of skins, probably of the elk or of the musk ox or of seals, curia bovina elforcerum, teeth ropes of whales, funes balnerum, which according to thee can hardly be sold for any suitable price. Wherefore thou hast asked instructions of the apostolic see as to what thou shouldst do in the premises. Accordingly, whilst we praise thy zealous solicitude, we answer thy question to this effect. Thou wilt endeavor to exchange the tithes of Greenland and aforesaid islands to the best possible advantage, either for silver or gold, and will forward this same as soon as thou canst, together with the other tithes collected in the kingdom for the relief of the Holy Land, faithfully informing as to the nature and amount of what thou sendest. We likewise write to our most dear Son in Christ, the illustrious King of Norway, asking him not to prevent nor to allow any one to prevent the free exportation from his kingdom of the tithes which are to be applied, according as the apostolic see shall see fit, to the relief of the aforesaid Holy Land, and effectually to endeavor to repeal the prohibition decreed against clerics of the said kingdom, forbidding any layman of the same to sell sterlings or other silver. Given at Orvieto, March the 4th, 1281. Number 6. Number 989. Letter from Pope Nicholas V, dated September 20th, 1448, to the Irish bishops at Schalhat and Holar, concerning the condition of the church in Greenland. Nicholas, etc., to our venerable brothers, Bishop at Skalhot, and Bishop of Holar, Health, etc., in directing the government of the universal church by virtue of the apostolic charge delivered to us from above, 
It is our solicitude in God's name to secure the salvation of souls redeemed by the precious blood of our Savior, not only by calming the storms of impiety and error which sweep over them, but also by sheltering them when exposed to calamities and the whirlwinds of persecution. From the natives and inhabitants of Greenland, an island said to be situated in the most distant parts of the ocean off the northern coast of the Kingdom of Norway, in the province of Drontheim, a mournful wail has reached our ears and sat in our heart. This people nearly six hundred years ago received the faith from the lips of their glorious apostle, the blessed King Olaf, and preserved it unchanged and pure, guided by the ordinances of the Holy Roman Church and the Apostolic See. In the lapse of time, burning with a constant devotion, they erected numerous churches and a splendid cathedral, in which divine worship was faithfully carried on, until, thirty years ago, by the permission of him who, in his inscrutable wisdom and knowledge, chastises those whom he loves in order to perfect them, barbarians from the neighboring pagan shores sent a fleet for the invasion of the island. The country was devastated with fire and sword. Sacred temples were destroyed in the whole island, which is said to be of vast extent. Only nine parochial churches were left untouched, because they could not easily be reached on account of their situation among the mountains. Many of the miserable natives of both sexes who seemed able to bear the yoke of perpetual slavery, and on account of their physical endurance best fitted for the purposes of their tyrants, were led away by them captives. However, as the same report added, after some time many of them returned to their native shores, and having here and there re-erected what the barbarians had demolished, they desired to spread divine worship and restore it to its former splendor. But past calamities had left them in such a starving and destitute condition that they were without the means of supporting a bishop and priests, and unless, in their desire for religious services, they could undertake a journey of many days to the churches which had escaped the hands of the barbarians, they were for those thirty years in want of the solace of a pastor and the ministry of priests. Accordingly, they have most humbly implored that in our paternal commiseration we would aid them in the gratification of their pious and salutary desire. We would deign to satisfy their spiritual wants and show our benevolence in that of the apostolic see in this matter. Wherefore, moved by the just and lawful petitions and desires of the aforesaid natives and inhabitants of the island of Greenland, and not having certain knowledge of the above facts and their circumstances, we by apostolic letters order one or both of you whom we understand to be of neighboring bishops, after having diligently examined and understood what we have said above, to ascertain whether it be true. If this is the state of affairs, and if you find the number and resources of the population sufficiently increased to make the expedient and fulfillment of their desire, it is our wish that you ordain fitting priests of exemplary life and provide rectors for the government of the restored parishes, and churches and for the administration of the sacraments. Moreover, if one or both of you, it seemed timely and expedient, having asked the advice of the Metropolitan, if the distance permit, we give you power to appoint and constitute as bishop for them some useful and qualified person, in communion with us and with the apostolic see, to consecrate him in our name with the usual form of the church, and to concede to him the administration of spiritual and temporal affairs, after having received from him a fitting and customary oath of allegiance to us and the apostolic see. Making this a matter of conscience, we, by our apostolic authority, concede to one or both of you full and unrestricted power in this matter, according to the tenor of these presents, all statites, all constitutions, whether apostolic or of general councils, or of any other kind, whatsoever notwithstanding. Given at Rome, at St. Potentianus, in the year, etc., 1488, twelfth day before the calends of October, the second year of our pontificate. Number 7. Number 990. Letter of Pope Alexander the Fourth, 1492-93 appointing Matthias, a monk of St. Benedict, to the bishopric of Gardar, Greenland, 
and describing the condition of the people of that country. We are informed that the church of Gadar, on the confines of the world in the country of Greenland, whose inhabitants are wont to subsist upon dried fish and milk on account of the dearth of bread, wine, and oil, and that because of the very rare voyages which can be made to the said country, owing to the freezing of the waters, no ship is supposed to have landed there during the past eighty years. We are told, moreover, that such voyages are not considered possible except in the month of August, after the thawing of the ice, and that no resident bishop or priest has governed the said church for some eighty years past. Hence, because of the absence of priests, it has happened that a great many of the inhabitants of that diocese, who were once Catholics, have, alas, denied the sacred baptism they had received. It is said that the people of that country have no other reminder of the Christian religion than a certain caparal, which they show once a year, and upon which the body of Christ was consecrated by the last resident priest one hundred years ago. Owing to these and other considerations, our predecessor, Pope Innocent the Eighth, of happy memory, wishing to provide an efficient and worthy pastor for the said church, which has for so long been deprived of such a consolation, in accordance with the advice of his brethren, of whom we were one, appointed to the said see our venerable brother Matthias, a professed member of the Order of St. Benedict, and now Bishop-elect of Gades, having been precognized at our request previous to our election. In his great zeal for the conversion of those who have fallen away and for the expiration of error, he now cheerfully resolves to set out upon his most dangerous voyage. Whilst most highly commending in the Lord his pious and laudable intention, we wish to assist him somewhat because of his poverty. Wherefore, of our own act, cognizance, and upon the advice and with the consent of our brethren, we command under penalty of excommunication to be incurred ipso facto, our beloved sons, the copyists, abbreviators, the solicitors, the officials of seals, and registrator, and all other officials in their respective offices, whether of the chancery or the apostolic chamber, to forward and to have forwarded promptly and entirely free of charge all apostolic letters concerning the promotion to the aforesaid Church of Gades, which have been sent to the said bishop-elect. Moreover, by the same act, with like cognizance and under the same penalties, to be incurred by those who disobey, and all else to the contrary notwithstanding, we order the clerics and notaries of the apostolic chamber to deliver to the said bishops all such briefs and bulls, without payment or exaction of any tax, or of any of the fees or gratuities usually paid on like occasions. Let everything be done gratis, in all the offices, because he is very poor, etc. This concludes the series of letters relating to the American continent on the files of the Vatican, dated prior to 1492, and while they furnish presumptive evidence that the existence of the unexplored lands and savage races west of Greenland was known to the Church, they are equally strong proof that Columbus received no information or an encouragement from them, particularly as he never expected or desired to discover new lands, but sought a shorter passage to the lands of opulence described by Marco Polo. End of section 28section 29 of the national geographic magazine volume 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org proceedings of the international geographic conference in chicago july 27 through the 28th 1893 memoirs and addresses Recent Disclosures Concerning Pre-Columbian Voyages to America in the Archives of the Vatican by William Elroy Curtis Part 3 The remaining letters from the Vatican files relating to the early history of America are of interest and historical value.
Number 8. Number 991. Letter of Pope Alexander the Sixth to Ferdinand and Isabella, dated May the 3rd, 1493, congratulating them upon the triumph of Columbus and granting to them full sovereignty over all lands discovered by him. Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, health, etc. Among the works which are pleasing to the Divine Majesty and dear to our hearts, none is so important as that of the exaltation and diffusion of the Christian religion and Catholic faith, more especially in these our times, the salvation of souls, and the repression and conversion of barbarous nations. Wherefore, when, by favor of God's clemency, and despite our inadequate merits, we were elevated to this holy see of Peter, knowing that you, like true Catholic kings and princes, as we have ever known you to be, and as your famous achievements now prove, not only ardently desire the same end, but strove to attain it with zeal and diligence, allowing yourselves to be deterred by no labors, expenses, dangers, nor even the effusions of your own blood, and being, moreover, aware that you had for a long time dedicated all your thoughts and efforts thereunto, as is shown by the recovery of Granada from the Saracen yoke, accomplished by you in these days, to such great glory of God's name, we with reason concluded to grant you, spontaneously and approvingly, whatsoever would enable you to promote, with ever-increasing zeal for God's glory, and the propagation of Christianity, an aim so holy, so laudable, and so pleasing to the immortal God. We have indeed heard that you, who had long been determined to search for and find certain remote and unknown continents and islands, which no one had ever discovered, in order to convert the natives and inhabitants thereof to the worship of the Redeemer and the profession of the Christian faith, being most earnestly engaged in the conquest and recovery of the said kingdom of Granada, were enabled to carry into execution your holy and laudable resolve. When at length, however, by God's will, the said kingdom had been reconquered by you, in your desire to begin at once the accomplishment of your purpose, sent our beloved son, Christopher Colon, with ships and suitable crews and cargoes, prepared with great labor, risk, and expense, to make diligent search for the said unknown and remote continents and islands in a sea whereon none had ever before sailed. Finally, with the divine assistance, and by the greatest effort, your envoys, while navigating the ocean to the westward, it is reported, in the direction of the Indies, discovered certain most distant islands and continents, also which had never before been found. The inhabitants whereof are numerous and peaceful, and, according to rumor, go naked and eat no meat. Moreover, as your said envoys have reason to think, the inhabitants of these islands believe in one God, the Creator, in heaven, and appear sufficiently disposed to embrace the Catholic faith, and to become imbued with good morals, and it is hoped that by means of instruction the name of our Lord Jesus Christ can easily be introduced into the said islands. The said Christopher has already erected a sufficiently fortified citadel, in which he has placed a garrison of his fellow voyagers, who are to search for other distant continents and islands. In those already discovered, gold, spices, and a great number of other precious products of different kinds and qualities are to be found. Wherefore you, on diligent consideration of all these facts, being, like your great and royal ancestors, as becomes Catholic kings and princes, most of all concerned with the exaltation and diffusion of the Catholic faith, have resolved with God's merciful assistance to subdue the aforesaid countries and to convert their inhabitants to the Catholic faith. Hence, whilst we most highly commend in the Lord your holy and laudable purpose and desire that it may be duly accomplished, and by this means our Saviour's name be made known in those countries, we most earnestly exhort you in the Lord and demand of you, in virtue, of holy baptism, by whose reception you have bound yourselves to obey our apostolic orders, and through the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, inasmuch as you intend all of your own free will, and out of zeal for the orthodox faith, to undertake this expedition, you will diligently, and out of a sense of duty, induce the inhabitants of the said countries to embrace the Christian religion. 
we moreover exhort you not to allow yourselves to be deterred by dangers or trials and to remain firm in the hope that almighty god will prosper your efforts and in order that you may the more willingly and courageously set about so great an undertaking after having received of the abundance of apostolic bounty by our own act without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by you or by another in your behalf but out of our sheer liberality with certain cognizance out of the fullness of apostolic power by the authority of almighty god given us in blessed peter and of the vicegerency of jesus christ which we exercise upon earth by tenor of these presents give grant and assign in perpetuity to you and your heirs and successors the kings of castile and leon all the aforesaid unknown continents and islands that have been or shall hereafter be discovered by your envoys which are not actually under the temporal dominion of any christian prince together with all their territories cities castles towns and villages all their rights jurisdictions and possessions we moreover create constitute and appoint you and your heirs and successors aforesaid lords of the same with full free and universal authority we decree however that by this our grant donation and assignment no acquired right of any christian ruler is to be understood as taken away nor is it to be taken away we moreover command you in virtue of holy obedience according to your promise which we feel certain you in your great devotion and royal magnanimity will fulfil to appoint with all due diligence virtuous god-fearing learned experienced and tried men who shall instruct the natives of the aforesaid islands in the catholic faith and imbue them with good morals moreover we strictly forbid under penalty of excommunication to be incurred in the act of disobedience all persons of whatsoever rank be it even imperial or royal state degree order or condition to presume to go whether for the purpose of trade or for any other whatsoever to the aforesaid islands and continents after they have been discovered by your envoys or by those sent for the purpose by you without your special permission and that of your aforesaid heirs and successors and inasmuch as certain kings of portugal have also by an apostolic grant made to them discovered and acquired other islands in the countries of africa guinea and the gold coast have been accorded different privileges favors liberties immunities exemptions and indults we wish you to use possess and enjoy all and every one of the same favors privileges exemptions liberties faculties immunities and indults all whose tenors we desire to be considered as though inserted word for word in the present letter and to be regarded as sufficiently expressed and inserted in the same just as if they had been granted to you and your heirs and successors by the same act authority knowledge and fullness of apostolic power and by special gift of favor we extend and give the same in all respects to you your heirs and successors aforesaid notwithstanding apostolic constitutions and orders and all which has been granted in the above letters and all else whatsoever to the contrary trusting in him from whom empires governments and all good things come that under his guidance of your actions your labors and endeavors will soon reach a most happy result to the joy and glory of all christendom if you do but continue in this holy and praiseworthy resolve enterprise since however it would be difficult to send the present letter to all those places in which it would be expedient to have it published we wish and by the same act and with like cognizance we decree that the same be copied by public notary thereunto deputed and sealed by some ecclesiastical dignitary and that the same value be attended to the said copies whether in or wherever else soever out of court as attaches to the present original should they be shown or exhibited no one shall go counter to our exhortation requisition donation grant assignment investiture act constitution deputation order inhibition indult exemption gift will and decree etc whosoever etc given in rome at st peter's in the year etc fourteen ninety three third of may in the first year of our pontificate col a de compania n casanova by order gratis b 
Capocci, D. Sorano. Number 9. Number 992. Letter of Pope Alexander the Sixth to Ferdinand and Isabella, dated May the 3rd, 1493, granting them sovereignty over all unknown continents and islands in the Indies that may be discovered by the explorers of Spain, and confining to Portugal the newly discovered lands of Africa. Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and Granada, health, etc., the sincere and extraordinary devotion, and the perfect faith with which you honor us, and the Roman Church, truly deserve that we approvingly grant you whatsoever may enable you to promote more speedily and effectually your holy and laudable undertaking of discovering remote and unknown continents, and islands for the glory of Almighty God, the extension of Christ's dominion, and the exaltation of the Catholic faith. Accordingly, by your own act, with full cognizance, and in virtue of the plenitude of apostolic authority, we have this day given, granted, and assigned to you and your heirs and successors, the sovereigns of Castile and Leon, in perpetuity, as is more fully set forth in our letter on this subject, all and every one of the remote and unknown continents and islands lying towards the west and the ocean, and not at present under the temporal authority of any Christian princes, which have been or shall be discovered by yourselves or your envoys, who have been equipped for the purpose of great pains, risks, and expense. We have included in the same donation all the states of the aforesaid continents, and their islands, their cities, castles, towns, and villages, rights, and all jurisdictions whatsoever. As, however, on another occasion, different privileges, favors, liberties, immunities, exemptions, faculties, briefs, and indults, were granted by the apostolic see to certain kings of Portugal, who, after obtaining a like apostolic donation, discovered and acquired other islands in the regions of Africa, Guinea, and the Gold Coast. We also, wishing, as is proper, to bestow equal favors, prerogatives, and benefits upon you and your heirs and successors aforesaid, by a similar act, without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by yourselves or another in your behalf, but out of sheer liberality, with like cognizance and fullness of apostolic power, by apostolic authority, and by gift of special favor, do hereby grant you and your heirs and successors aforesaid the free and legitimate exercise, possession and enjoyment in the islands and countries thus far discovered, or that shall hereafter be discovered by yourselves, or in your names, of all the favors, liberties, privileges, exemptions, faculties, immunities, briefs, and indults which have been accorded to the kings of Portugal. We desire that the tenors of all the aforesaid concessions be considered as inserted word for word in the present letter, and as sufficiently inserted and expressed to signify that the said favors are specially granted to you and your heirs and successors aforesaid. In like matter and form, we give in perpetuity all the above to you and your heirs and successors aforesaid apostolic decrees and ordinances, and all of a similar nature, that is contained in the letters to the kings of Portugal, to the contrary notwithstanding, etc., given in Rome at St. Peter's, May 3, 1493, in the first year of our pontificate. Number 10. Number 995. Bull of the Pope Alexander the Sixth, dated May the 12th, 1493, Establishing the Line of Demarcation Between the Dominions of Spain and Portugal Alexander, etc., to his most dear son and daughter in Christ, the illustrious Ferdinand and Isabella, King and Queen of Castile and Leon, Aragon, Sicily, and Granada, health, etc., among those works which are pleasing to the Divine Majesty and dear to our heart, none is so important as that of the exaltation and diffusion of the Christian religion and Catholic faith more especially during our times, the salvation of souls, and the repression and conversion of the barbarous nations. Wherefore, when by favor of God's clemency, and despite our own inadequate merits, we were elevated to this holy see of Peter, knowing that you, like true Catholic kings and princes, as we have ever known you to be, and as your most famous achievements now prove, not only ardently desired the same end, but strove to attain it with zeal and diligence, 
allowing yourselves to be deterred by no labors, expenses, dangers, nor even by effusion of your own blood, and knowing, moreover, that you had for a long time dedicated all your thoughts and efforts thereunto, as is shown by the recovery of Granada from the Saracen yoke, brought about by you in these days to such great glory of God's name, we with reason concluded to grant you spontaneously and approvingly whatsoever would enable you to promote with ever-increasing zeal for God's glory and the propagation of Christianity, a name so holy, so laudable, and so pleasing to the immortal God. We have, indeed, heard that you, who had long been determined to search for and find certain remote and unknown continents and islands, which no one had ever discovered, in order to convert the natives and inhabitants thereof to the worship of the Redeemer and the profession of the Christian faith, being most earnestly engaged in the reduction and recovery of the said kingdom of Granada, were unable to carry into execution your holy and laudable resolve. When at length, however, by God's will, the said kingdom had been reconquered, you, in your desire to begin at once the accomplishment of your purpose, sent our beloved son, Christopher Colon, a worthy and most commendable man, and well fitted for so great an undertaking, with ships and suitable crews and cargoes, prepared with great labor, risk, and expense, to make diligent search for the said remote and unknown continents and islands, in a sea whereon none had ever before sailed. Finally, with the divine assistance, and by dint of the greatest care, your envoys, while navigating the ocean, discovered certain most distant islands, and continents also, which had never before been found, the inhabitants whereof are numerous and peaceful, and, according to report, go naked and eat no meat. Moreover, as your said envoys have reason to think, the inhabitants of these islands believe in one God, the Creator in heaven, and appear sufficiently disposed to embrace the Catholic faith, and to become imbued with good morals, and it is hoped that by means of instruction, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ can be easily introduced into the said islands. The said Christopher has already erected a sufficiently fortified citadel, in which he has placed a garrison of his fellow voyagers, who are to search for other distant continents and islands. In those already discovered, gold, spices, and a great number of other precious products of different kinds and qualities are to be found. Wherefore you, after diligently considering all these facts, being like your great and royal ancestors, as becomes Catholic kings and princes, most of all concerned with the exaltation and the diffusion of the Catholic faith, have resolved with God's merciful assistance to subdue the aforesaid countries and to convert their inhabitants to the Catholic faith. Hence, whilst we most highly commend in the Lord your holy and laudable purpose and desire that it be duly accomplished, and that by this means our Saviour's name be made known in those countries, we most earnestly exhort you in the Lord, and demand of you in virtue of holy baptism, by whose reception you have bound yourselves to obey our apostolic orders, and through the bowels of the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that inasmuch as you intend of your own free will and out of zeal for the orthodox faith to undertake this expedition, you will diligently and out of a sense of duty induce the inhabitants of the said countries to embrace the Christian religion, we moreover exhort you not to allow yourselves to be deterred by dangers or trials, and to remain firm in the hope that Almighty God will prosper your endeavors. And in order that you may the more willingly and courageously set about so great an undertaking, after having received of the abundance of apostolic bounty by our own act, without being moved thereunto by any petition presented to us by you or by another in your behalf, but out of our sheer liberality, with certain cognizance, out of the fullness of apostolic power, by the authority of Almighty God given us in blessed Peter, and of the vicergerency of Christ, which we exercise upon earth, we by tenor of these presents give, grant, and assign in perpetuity to you and your heirs and successors, the kings of Castile and Leon, all the islands and continents that have been or shall be found and discovered westward and southward in a line drawn from the arctic pole or the north to the antarctic pole or the south whether these continents or islands that have been or shall be found lie in the direction of india or in any other country 
the said line to be one hundred leagues distant to the west and south from the most western and the most southern of the islands commonly called the azores and cape verde that is to say all the islands that have been or shall be discovered west or south of the aforesaid line which were not actually owned by any other christian king or prince prior to the last feast of the nativity of our lord jesus christ from which the present year fourteen hundred and ninety three began at the time when some of the aforesaid islands were discovered by your envoys and captains together with all their territories cities castles towns and villages all their rights jurisdictions and possessions we moreover create constitute and appoint you and your heirs and successors aforesaid lords of the same with full free and universal authority we decree however that by this our grant donation and assignment no acquired right of any christian ruler who was in actual possession of any of the said islands prior to the above-mentioned feast of the nativity of our lord jesus christ is to be understood as taken away nor is it to be taken away we moreover command you in virtue of holy obedience according to your promise which we feel certain you in your royal devotion and royal magnanimity will fulfil to appoint with all due diligence virtuous god-fearing learned experienced and well-tried men who shall instruct the natives of the aforesaid islands in the catholic faith and imbue them with good morals moreover we strictly forbid under penalty of excommunication to be incurred in the act of disobedience all persons of whatsoever rank be it even imperial or royal state decree order or condition to presume to go whether for the purpose of trade or for any other whatsoever to the continents or islands that have been and shall be discovered to the west and south of a line drawn from the north to the south poles whether in the direction of india or of any other country the said line to be one hundred leagues distant to the west and south from the most western and the most southern islands of these commonly called the azores and cape verde as has already been set forth without the special permission of yourselves and your aforesaid heirs and successors apostolic constitutions and decrees and all else to the contrary notwithstanding we trust in him from whom empires governments and all good things proceed that if you persevere in this your holy and laudable purpose your labors and endeavors will under the divine guidance be speedily crowned with a most fruitful result to the joy and glory of all christendom etc given in rome at st peter's in the year of the lord's incarnation fourteen ninety three may the twelfth in the first year of our pontificate number eleven number nine ninety six bull of pope alexander the sixth dated rome june twenty fifth fourteen ninety three confirming bernard boyle as the first missionary to the new world alexander etc to our beloved son bernard boyle friar of the order of the minors and vicar of the said order in the kingdom of spain health etc by virtue of the apostolic authority with certain cognizance and by tenor of these presents we grant to thee who art a priest full free and universal faculty permission power and authority and the same to any members of thine own or another order to be selected by thyself or by the queen and king viz ferdinand and isabella without any necessity of permission unto this end from thy superiors or from any others whatsoever to go to the aforesaid islands and countries and to reside therein at your pleasure to preach and sow the word of god of thyself or by means of another or other suitable priests whether secular or regular and of whatsoever orders to bring into the catholic faith the said natives and inhabitants to baptize and instruct them in that faith and to administer to them as often as necessary the sacraments of the church to hear them one and all in their confessions whenever requisite either in person or by means of another or other priests whether secular or regular and after having carefully heard them to grant them the required absolution for their crimes excesses and transgressions even from such as may demand consultation of the apostolic see in any wise whatsoever and enjoin them upon their salutary penance to commute to other works of piety all their temporal vows excepting only those of pilgrimage to jerusalem the tombs of the apostles of peter and paul st james of compostella and the vows of religion to be found and erect provided nobody's right be infringed upon thereby 
any churches whatsoever, chapels, monasteries, houses of any religious orders whatsoever, even of mendicant orders, whether for men or women, holy places with belfries, bells, dormitories, cloisters, refectories, orchards, gardens, and any other necessary adjuncts, to receive into houses of the professed of mendicant orders erected by thee for the same, and to grant permission to dwell permanently therein, to bless the said churches, and as often as they and their respective cemeteries chance to be desecrated, whether by the shedding of blood, pollution, or otherwise, to bless and rededicate them through any Catholic priest, after the customary manner, to eat freely and lawfully, and as often as necessary, meats and other kinds of food that are forbidden thee and thy associates by the rules of the said orders, with regard to which matter we charge your consciences, and to execute and dispose all things and everything in the above and all things necessary thereto. Moreover, in order that the faithful may the more willingly go to those countries and islands out of devotion, and in the hopes of securing the salvation of their souls, we grant to all and every one of the aforesaid faithful, of either sex, who personally go to the aforesaid countries and islands by order and with consent, however, of the above-mentioned king and queen, the choice of a suitable confessor, either secular or regular, who shall have power to absolve them, all or any one of them, after the manner above stated, from their crimes, transgressions, and even such sins as are reserved to the said sea, to commute their vows, and to impart to them, in virtue of the aforesaid authority, once in life and at the hour of death, indulgence and remission of all their sins, for which they shall be heartily sorry, and which they shall have orally confessed, continuing steadfastly in the sincerity of faith, in union with the Holy Roman Church, and in obedience and fealty to us and to the Roman pontiffs, our legitimate successors. We also grant to the monasteries, establishments, and houses, which may be founded, and to the monks, brethren, and temporary sojourners therein, the full and lawful exercise, possession, and benefit of all and every one of the favors, privileges, liberties, exemptions, immunities, indulgences, and concessions which have been given in general, or which may hereafter be given to the monasteries, establishments, houses, and to the monks and brethren of the orders to which the aforesaid places and persons belong, we bestow the above as a mark of special favor, notwithstanding the decrees of our predecessor of happy memory, Pope Boniface the Eighth, forbidding mendicant friars to accept new houses without special permission of the said see, etc. Given at Rome from St. Peter's, in the year 1493, June the 25th, in the first year of our pontificate. Number 12. Number 997. Pope Julius II commends Bartholomew, the brother, and Diego, the son of Columbus, to the favor of King Ferdinand, dated April the 10th, 1507. Our most dear son in Christ, health, etc. Our beloved son, Bartholomew Colon, the brother of Christopher, who of late years discovered those islands of India, who were unknown to our forefathers, being on his way to see your majesty, tarried with us in order to show his devotion to our person. We kindly received him and heard him because of his long sojourn in those islands. We were, moreover, pleased to give him our recommendation, inasmuch as Christian governments appear to have greatly profited by the discovery of the said islands. Wherefore we beseech your majesty, whose aim and desire has ever been the good of the Catholic faith, to consider Bartholomew himself and his nephew, the admiral of the said islands, as most highly recommended, though we are of the opinion that you will do this of your own accord. Given at Rome, April the 10th, 1507, in the fourth year of our pontificate. Number 13. Number 998. Bowl of Pope Leo X. August the 28th, 1513, appointing John of Quevedos of Santa Maria de Antigua, Darien, the first bishop on the American continent, also letters to the people of that diocese, and to Queen Johanna of Spain. Leo X, to our beloved son, John of Quevedos, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, health, etc., the debt of our pastoral office requires that amidst the diverse cares by which we are constantly harassed, this above all should occupy our attention, that over all churches, and especially those which, 
like young plants budding forth in the garden of the Lord, are most exposed to the misfortunes of vacancy, by our diligence those pastors be appointed, through whose fruitful care the same churches may, with the Lord's help, be able to receive a happy increase in spiritual and temporal affairs. A short time ago we reserved to our appointment and disposal provisions for all churches which were then vacant, or which from that time forward should become vacant, declaring thenceforth null and void all attempts made to the contrary, no matter by whom or by what authority, whether designedly or not. Afterwards, however, the church at Santa Maria del Antiqua became vacant, which we today, counseled by our venerable brothers, and in the plenitude of our apostolic power, have erected in that newly discovered land of primeval India, liberated from pagan tyranny under the auspices of our beloved son in Christ, Ferdinand, illustrious king of Aragon and both Sicilies. We then, to provide quickly and happily for the same church, concerning which none but us could or can provide on account of our reservation, and decree to the contrary with paternal and solicitous care, carefully deliberated with our venerable brothers regarding the choice of a useful and zealous person to place over the same church, lest it be subjected to the ravages of a long vacancy. And finally, we directed to our mind's eye to you, a priest and professed member of the orders of Friars Minor, known as Observance, you of whose zeal for religion, literary requirements, purity of life, regularity of morals, providence in spiritual and circumspection in temporal affairs, and many other virtuous gifts suitable to testimony has been given, all which things having been duly considered by the council of the same brothers, we, the aforesaid authority, make provision for that church in your person, you who for your merits have proved acceptable to them, and to us, and we appoint you its bishop and pastor, committing entirely to you its care and the administration of its spiritual and temporal matters, and confiding in the giver of mercies, we hope that God, directing your actions, that church, under your wise and happy government, may with the help of God's grace be usefully and prosperously ruled and receive a gratifying increase in temporal and spiritual affairs. Receive then with alacrity the yoke of the Lord which we place upon your shoulders, strive to care for and administer that church with such fidelity, solicitude, and prudence that it may rejoice in being committed to so provident and profitable an administration, and that you, besides a reward in eternity, may merit henceforth more abundant blessings and grace from us and the apostolic see. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the Incarnation of our Lord, 1513, the fifth day before the Ides of September, the first year of our pontificate. In like manner to our beloved children, the people of the city, and the diocese of the Church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, health, etc. Today, advised by our brothers, and in the fullness of our apostolic authority, we provide for the Church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, in the islands of India, which has been vacant since its first erection, in the person of our beloved John, elect of Santa Maria de la Antigua, acceptable to us and to our brothers for his merits, and we appoint him bishop and pastor of the same, committing entirely to him its care and administration in spiritual and temporal matters, according as is more fully expressed in our letters written to this effect. Wherefore, we earnestly ask and exhort you all, we order you by apostolic letters to receive the same John, elect as your father and pastor of your souls, with grateful honor, to pay him devout and fitting reverence, humbly to obey his salutary admonitions and commands, so that he may rejoice to have found in you dutiful sons, and you in consequence to have found him a benevolent father. Given as above. In the same manner, to our beloved daughter in Christ, Johanna, illustrious Queen of Castile and Leon, health, etc., grace, etc., since then, beloved daughter in Christ, it is the work of virtue to act with benign favor towards the ministers of God, and to revere them by word and deed for the glory of the eternal King. We earnestly request and exhort your royal serenity, out of love for us and the apostolic see, to consider the same John, elect, and his church of Santa Maria de la Antigua, as most heartily commended, etc., given as above. Number 14. 
Letters from Pope Leo granting authority for the confirmation of John of Quevados as Bishop of Darien. 102014 De Campania. Leo X, to our beloved son John of Quevados, elect of Santa Maria de Lantiqua, health, etc. Since we, by apostolic authority, counseled by our brothers, have thought it proper to provide for the church of Santa Maria de Lantiqua, in a certain manner bereft of the solace of a pastor, in your person acceptable to us, and to our brothers, as your merits require, appointing you its bishop and pastor, according as is contained more fully in our letter written for that reason, graciously attending to what may be your greater convenience, we grant your request, conceding to you full and free leave, according to the tenor of these presents, to receive consecration at the hands of whatsoever Catholic bishop you wish. In favor and communion, we grant to the same bishop leave by our authority, freely and lawfully, to perform the aforesaid function, after having received from you, in our name, and that of the Roman Church, the usual oath of fidelity, according to the form indicated by these presents. However, we wish, and by the aforesaid authority, command and decree, that if the same bishop presume to confer on you that charge, without having received from you the aforesaid oath, and if you dare to accept it, that bishop be suspended from the exercise of his pontifical office, and both he and you be suspended, by that very fact from the administration of your churches, in both spiritual and temporal matters. We desire, moreover, that you see to it that the form of this oath be taken by you, be sent to us as soon as possible, through your own nuncio, word for word, by your letters, patent signed with your own seal. This is the form of the oath which you will take. I, John, elect of Santa Maria de Lantiqua, from this hour henceforth will be faithful and obedient to blessed Peter and the Holy Roman Church, and to our Lord Pope Leo X, and his successors canonically constituted, so help me God and these his holy gospel. Given at Rome at St. Peter's in the year of the incarnation of our Lord, 1513, the fourth day before the Ides of September, in the first year, 1020, de Campania. Number 15. Letter from Pope Leo X, granting absolution to John of Quevedos, Bishop of Darien. To our beloved son, John of Quevedos, professed member of the Order of Friars Minor, known as Observance, Health, etc. The customary clemency of the Apostolic See employs opportune remedies, according as is fitting, in order that the disposition made by it, for the time being, regarding cathedral churches, may not meet with opposition, but that the persons to be placed over them may be able to preside over the same with pure heart and sincere conscience. Whereas, then, we this day, with the advice of our brothers, provide in your person acceptable to us and to our brothers, as your merits require, for the church of Santa Maria de Lantiqua, which, vacant from its early erection, Still now, we by apostolic authority, and counseled by the same brothers, have this day erected, and whereas we intend to place you over it as its bishop and pastor, desiring that this provision and appointment meet with no opposition on account of any ecclesiastical sentences or censures which you may have been under. We, according to the tenor of these presents, by apostolic authority, do absolve you, and do declare you absolved henceforth from any excommunication, suspension, etc., to this end only that the aforesaid provision and appointment and all the apostolic letters written above obtain their effect, notwithstanding apostolic constitutions and ordinations, and whatsoever others to the contrary, no one therefore to infringe on our absolution and declaration, etc., if any one, etc., given at Rome, at St. Peter's, in the year of the Incarnation of our Lord, 1513, the day before, the fifth day before the Calends of September, 1020, De Campania. Number 16. Number 1002. Letter from Pope Clement the Seventh, dated Rome, June 7, 1526, to Friar Francisco de los Angeles, Minister General of the Order of St. Francis, bestowing upon him the apostolic benediction upon his departure for America. 
Clement the Seventh to Brother Francis of the Angels, Minister General of the Order of St. Francis, Beloved Son, etc. In our recent conversations with you, we had the occasion to admire your spirit of religion and sanctity, your learning and prudence, and your zeal for the honor of God and His worship, and we are of opinion that such dispositions on your part fully deserve our paternal love and favor. Being Minister General of the Order of St. Francis, because of your virtues and services to religion, you desire to see the Christian faith preached and propagated in the new world, among the nations of those countries recently discovered by our most dear son in Christ, Charles, Emperor-elect of the Spains, etc., and Catholic King. Not content with having sent your brethren and religions to those new nations, you wish to go to them in person, and, like God's holy apostle, devote your whole strength to infusing into their minds the truth of the gospel, and extending the limits of Christendom to those distant regions, by means of the most holy sign of the cross. You are now preparing yourself for your apostolic, and are on the point of taking your departure. We pray God to bless your holy dispositions and the zeal which impels you to so salutary a work, upon which we congratulate you exceedingly. We exhort you to persevere with hope and confidence in this undertaking, which you have chosen to direct in person. We pray, Almighty God, who inspires you with so much zeal, to aid you with his heavenly light, that you may the more easily induce those nations, now lying in darkness, to accept the truth. We give you our apostolic benediction, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. After the examples of Jesus Christ our Savior, we send you, as he sent his apostles, to conquer for heaven, which will be your reward, those countries and nations, in the name of the same, Jesus Christ our Lord. Given at Rome, the 7th of June, 1526, in the third year of our pontificate. Number 17. Number 1003. Letter from Pope Clement the Seventh to Charles V of Spain, dated October the 19th, 1532, authorizing missionaries to be sent to America. To our dearest son in Christ, Charles, ever August Emperor of the Romans. Our dearest son in Christ, health, etc. You have recently made known to us that by the blessing of the Lord you have subjected to your authority some other islands of the new world, and a savage people living therein unacquainted with the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and the orthodox faith, and that, unable to provide for the salvation of the souls of the natives, and to procure their instruction in the faith, you desire that there be appointed some professed members of an approved religious body who shall preach and make known the word of God in these islands, and direct and guide the natives in the way of the Lord's commandments. Accordingly, in God's name, we most heartily approve your pious desire, and in plenitude of our apostolic authority, grant you by these presents full and unrestricted power to assign for this work 120 minorities of the order of preachers, and 10 professed Geronimites, whom you, beloved son, or your representatives, in those islands shall ascertain to be qualified for the undertaking and willing to assume it. We grant, moreover, to those professed religions liberty to repair thither even without having asked or obtained the permission of their superiors, to preach there the word of God, and for this purpose to reside there, living, however, in a manner becoming the religious and wearing the habit of their order. It is also our wish that these religions have free and lawful possession, use and enjoyment of each, and every one of the privileges, immunities, exemptions, prerogatives, favors, and indults, which other members of the same order, dwelling in their own houses and monasteries, possess, use and enjoy by law, custom, or any other title. And this we concede, notwithstanding constitutions and provisions of the apostolic see, statutes of the aforesaid orders confirmed by oath, apostolic letters to these orders and to their superiors, prelates and members, no matter of what tenor they may be, what form they may have, and what clauses or decrees they may be furnished with, even if granted freely and spontaneously, with certain knowledge, and in the form of a brief and though conceded repeated times, approved and renewed, all of which and all other provisions to the contrary, we especially and expressly annul in this case, though otherwise they are to remain in full force. 
given at Rome, etc., the 19th of October, 1532. Ninth Year, Blosius. End of Section 29「Section 30 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27 through 28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. Early Voyages Along the Northwestern Coast of America by Professor George Davidson, Ph.D., S.C.D., etc., President of the Geographical Society of the Pacific. Part 1. Preliminary Remarks. The geodetic work of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey was extended to the Pacific seaboard in 1850, at a time when the geography of the coast was very imperfectly known, and when the names of capes, bays, rivers, and islands were in much confusion. Part of my duty in the initiation of this public work consisted in the determination of the latitude and longitude of the headlands, islands, harbors, rivers, rocks, and dangers, and in the geographic reconnaissance of the coastline from the Mexican boundary to the 49th parallel. While in command of the surveying brig Fauntleroy, I entered upon the self-imposed task of writing a coast pilot for California, Oregon, and Washington. Very naturally, my early interest in the old explorations became intensified as I sought to give the authority for each discovery and for each name, and I made many special examinations of the narratives that were then available for the identification of doubtful localities. This work continued with more or less directness until I was gathering the material for rewriting the fourth edition of the Coast Pilot, and when I had familiarized myself with every mile of our own coast, and had a fair acquaintance with the ocean coast of Lower California as far as San Jose del Cabo. Along the whole seaboard, I had sketched the landfall, the headlands, and the notable features of the coast to be able to recall their peculiarities. Collation of the Old Narratives In order to preserve some of the results of these investigations, incidental to my official duties, I determined to collate the narratives of Uloa, 1539, Cabrillo and Ferrello, 1542-43, Drake, 1579, and Vizcaiano, 1602-03, and later authorities. And in the extended record thereof, I am satisfied that most, if not every one, of the discrepancies of the old Spanish and English navigators have been reconciled. The inaccuracies of the earliest discoverers arose principally from errors of their crude instruments, ignorance of the coast currents, errors of judgment in estimating distances, unreliable compasses, etc. Among the Spanish discoverers, the meagerness of detailed descriptions, a failure to seize the salient points for determining their positions, the want of minute accuracy in most of their plans, sometimes giving importance to general features and sometimes to details without distinction, and a human weakness to exaggerate certain discoveries and yet to overlook completely others as or more important have much involved the locating of many of their landfalls, headlands, bays, and anchorages. Even with the accuracy of Vizcaiano, personal acquaintance with parts of the coast is absolutely necessary to establish identification. The earlier navigators had not the education to carry through extensive and orderly narratives, and we can easily imagine that the priest, who invariably accompanied these expeditions, was the principal author of the reports. Moreover, the effects of the ever-present scurvy harassed the commander and lowered the whole nervous tone of the strongest men and the wretched Indians. Vizcaiano returned with half his crew and but two or three men able to do ordinary duty. The broken records of Drake's two anchorages on our Pacific coast are very meager and unsatisfactory until carefully weighed and elucidated by personal knowledge and the assembling of nearly contemporary material. The minuteness of record in the full and faithful narratives of Cook and Vancouver, of comparatively recent date, has enabled me to follow their track day by day and to correct their positions by personal knowledge of the localities which they describe. 
but while giving these great discoverers the fullest credit for surveys unparalleled before or since their time, when all the attendant circumstances are considered, I cannot withhold my admiration for the indomitable courage and perseverance of the older Spanish navigators who, in ill-conditioned and ill-supplied vessels, with crude instruments and methods, and with crews nearly destroyed by scurvy, fought their way from the tropics to the wildest parts of the Alaskan coast, regardless of seasons. There were giants in the earth in those days. The records of such of these earlier voyages as have been published are too short and meager to be of much more value than isolated statements of what was done on given dates, and the inaccuracy of the observations for the determination of the geographic positions has led many writers to judge that all these men were touched with the spirit of Maldonado, De Fonte, and De Fuca. In comparatively recent controversy, which was unfortunately marred by national feelings, Cabrillo and Ferrello have been placed not only at the latitudes which their erroneous instruments presumably gave, but located on the immediate coast, when they were storm-driven far to seaward, while Drake has, even at this late day, been carried as far north as the island of Vancouver. But with the present knowledge of our coast, it is possible to locate Uloa in his heroic struggle north of the Gulf of Sebastian Vizcaino, to track Cabrillo and Ferrello in their discoveries in the terrific southeasters of our midwinter, to place Drake under Cape Ferrello and Punta de los Reyes, and to fix with certainty the most of Vizcaino's positions. Later than 1603, I have not undertaken identifications in this short paper except to incidentally mention Father Terraval's visit to Port Eugenio and his landing upon Natividad and Cerros Islands, which has been so much misapprehended by a recent author. The Voyages of Cabrillo and Ferrello, 1542-43 I was particularly interested in the voyages of Cabrillo and Ferrello, and in studying their narratives have endeavored to put myself in their places. Understanding the character of the seasons and the difficulties of the winds, currents, swells, and fogs which they encountered, I have tried to follow them day by day in their exciting discoveries. The two narratives had to be collated and studied as a general statement, then every word and idiomatic phrase had to be carefully weighed and defined. The mistranslation of certain words in Cabrillo, Ferrello, and Vizcaiano had misled previous investigators. I based my translation of the narrative of Cabrillo upon the condensed, unconnected, and unsatisfying chapters of Herrera, corrected several mistakes, and deciphered one or two obscure passages. Ferrello's narrative is in moderate detail and presents several critical passages where important issues are involved, yet I feel satisfied that every case of doubt has been elucidated. These two narratives are of unequal value. The original of Cabrillo has certainly been lost, and as he died during the exploration, the statements after the first ten days are extremely meager. Discoveries like that of San Diego Bay are not mentioned. Once there is a difference of date with Ferrello, and occasionally particular expressions are common to both narratives. For Drake's share of discovery on this coast, we have The World Encompassed, printed by the Hacklet Society, The Arcano del Mare of Dudley, The English Hero, and later productions. For the narrative of Vizcaiano, I have used the Noticia della California, etc., by the Father Miguel Venegas, of which the published English translation is unsatisfactory. So far as I have learned, there are no charts of Uloa, Cabrillo and Ferrello, extant. Learning that there was a manuscript chart in the Royal Museum of Munchen, exhibiting the line of coast as seen by Drake between latitudes 42.5 degrees and 38 degrees, I obtained full-size photographs of this invaluable record, which was evidently the basis for Dudley's chart of that part of the coast in his Arcano del Mare of 1647. Except the orientation of Drake's chart, the shoreline from Rogue River in 42.5 degrees to Drake's Bay under 38 degrees is remarkably consistent with the general outline of the coast as laid down by the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey. From the British Museum, I obtained tracings of the Portus Novi Albionis of Drake, and part of the hemisphere whereon is shown his northwesternmost position and the Crescent City Reef, the Dragon Rocks of Vancouver, never before connected with his landfall of the coast. To trace Vizcaiano's narrative, I first followed his chart of California, as given by Bernie, but have since obtained from the State Department at Washington copies of the coastline 
as drawn from his 32 plans by the navigators of the Sutil and Mexicano, 1802, with all his names. This chart is a variable scale and without parallels of latitude, but when these are supplied through means of well-recognized capes and harbors, it is a remarkably good work for that period. The modern charts which have been consulted have all been made by the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, and the coast pilots from San Jose del Cabo northward have been consulted for exactness of geographic position and for the views of headlands. The Errors of Their Instruments As the investigation progressed, it became evident that there were large errors in the determinations of the latitude by Cabrillo and Ferrello. These and the erroneous estimates of distances were at first very confusing for the identification of capes and harbors insufficiently described, and I had to rely upon my personal knowledge of the coast and seaboard to locate them. The navigators rarely gave the latitude nearer than half a degree, but the effect of this was not apparent at the outset, where their reported measures were very nearly in accord with the true positions. When I had established the large and constantly increasing errors as the vessels sailed northward, the identification was much simplified. There were several points on the coast of Mexico, and one or more near the southern extremity of Lower California, whose latitudes were doubtless known to all the navigators with a reasonable degree of accuracy, and evidently accepted by Cabrillo and Ferrello. The latitude of Puerto de Navidad, whence the San Salvador and La Victoria sailed, is 19 degrees 13 minutes north, and quite naturally it is not mentioned by either of the captains. Cape Corrientes, which is well known, is distant 30 leagues from Navidad, in latitude 20 degrees 25 minutes, and although Ferrello says that they had a southeast wind and estimated the distance at 40 leagues, Cabrillo places the cape in latitude 20 degrees and a half. At this time, I assume he did not observe for the latitude but adopted that given by previous authorities. After crossing the Gulf of California, Cabrillo says, on Sunday, the 2nd of July, they found themselves in 24 degrees and more, and recognized the Puerto del Marquez del Valle, which they called La Cruz, which is the coast of California. Ferrello says they anchored the following Monday on the 3rd of the same month off the point of California, etc., the easternmost land of the peninsula of Lower California is Cape Pulmo, under which there is a good anchorage and fresh water. The eastern point of the land, which is a cliff 410 feet high and rises rapidly inland, is in latitude 23 degrees 23 minutes, and if Cabrillo observed for latitude, as we may feel assured he did when he made this landfall, the correction to his determination is 0 degrees 37 minutes and more. At Cape San Lucas, the southwesternmost point of the peninsula, the ships anchored in the comfortable bay and took in water. The anchorage is in latitude 22 degrees 52 minutes, and its position was already known. Cabrillo does not mention this harbor, and Ferrello evidently did not observe for latitude, for his narrative states, they say that this port is in 23 degrees. This indicates a correction of 0 degrees 0 .08 minutes to the assumed position. From Cape San Lucas, the navigators followed the coast, which Uloa had discovered three years earlier. If they had copies of his chart or of his report, they never refer to them or to him or use his names of capes and bays, except the island of Cedros. Northward of Cape San Lucas, we begin to find the large errors of latitude, which began at the point of California. As they were reconnoitering the coast during the summer months, the weather was generally fair for observation, the winds adverse and sometimes quite strong, the swell heavy and the fogs increasing as they advanced. Until well to the northward, the fogs would rarely prevent a noon observation for latitude. The two narratives refer to 71 positions that are subject to identification, yet it is somewhat singular that the Cabrillo narrative has only two independent observations for latitude, while the Ferrello narrative has 22. Whenever the latitude of a place is given by both narratives, which occurs eight times, the two statements are identical, except in the case of Point Conception, where the correction to Cabrillo's determination is 2 degrees 3 minutes and to Ferrello's 1 degree 33 minutes and more. The corrections with a gradual increase as the latitude increases are fairly uniform for certain stretches when we consider that the latitude was rarely stated closer than half a degree, 
except to add that it was more on four occasions and scant on another. From latitude 23 degrees 23 minutes to 28 degrees 6 minutes, the average correction to 11 determinations is 0 degrees 48 minutes, with a range from 37 minutes to 58 minutes. From latitude 28 degrees 55 minutes to 31 degrees 45 minutes, the average correction to 9 determinations is 1 degree 4 minutes, with a range from 42 minutes to 75 minutes. From latitude 31 degrees 51 minutes to 34 degrees 27 minutes, the average correction to 9 determinations is 1 degree 24 minutes, with a range from 60 minutes to 123 minutes. This line of coast includes San Diego, San Buenaventura, and Point Conception. From latitude 36 degrees 3 minutes to 38 degrees 31 minutes, the average correction to 8 determinations is 1 degree 18 minutes, with a range from 79 minutes to 91 minutes, including the determination in the Gulf of the Farallones and of the landfall of Cato Mountain, which are not closely located. It is somewhat remarkable that the position of San Diego Bay and of Point Conception, which latter was to them a notable cape, should present larger errors of the instruments than any other places on the coast. At San Diego, the correction to Ferrello's determination is 1 degree 40 minutes, and at Point Conception, 1 degree 33 minutes and more to Ferrello, and 2 degrees 3 minutes to Cabrillo. In these extreme and infrequent cases, I suspect erroneous readings of the instruments, amounting to not less than 30 minutes of arc, or of the whole diameter of the sun. These corrections must govern the high latitudes which the navigators report to have reached when they were struggling for life in the great storms far from land, and almost up to the latitude reached by Drake less than 37 years later. Erroneous Estimates of Distances The estimates of distances along the exposed seaboard when the vessels were buffeted by the regular northwesters and the large swell and offshore adverse current are, as a rule, so irregular and erroneous that they are almost useless for determining intermediate positions. When they reach the quieter waters of the Santa Barbara Channel, with little wind, before the rainy season, with very small swell and little current, it was possible to proportion the erroneous estimate of distance between San Buenaventura and Point Conception, and with a personal knowledge of localities, I was able to fix every anchorage they made under that pleasant and populous coast, and where they held frequent intercourse with the friendly Indians. End of section 30. Section 31 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27 through 28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. Early Voyages Along the Northwestern Coast of America by Professor George Davidson, Ph.D., S.C.D., etc., President of the Geographical Society of the Pacific. Part 2. The Main Features of the Discoveries of Cabrillo and Ferrello. The general progress of the two ships may be first briefly stated by mentioning the more easily identified places and then by following their narratives in more or less detail. The vessels sailed in company from Cape San Lucas in latitude 22 degrees 52 minutes, July 6, 1542, reached Magdalena Bay in latitude 24 degrees 32 minutes, July 13, Pequena Bay and Point in latitude 26 degrees 14 minutes, July 19, Port San Bartolome in latitude 27 degrees 39 minutes, August 1, Saros Island in latitude 28 degrees 2 minutes, August 5, Point Canoas in latitude 29 degrees, 25 minutes, August 15. Port San Quentin in latitude 30 degrees, 24 minutes, where they took possession of the country, August 21. Point Santo Tomas in latitude 31 degrees, 33 minutes, September 8. San Diego Bay in latitude 32 degrees, 40 minutes, September 28. Santa Catalina Island 
in latitude 33 degrees, 27 minutes, October 7, and San Buenaventura at the eastern entrance to the Santa Barbara Channel in latitude 34 degrees, 17 minutes, October 10. During these three months, their progress had been very slow because the prevailing summer wind was directly ahead and they must have made many and many attack to work their clumsy vessels to windward. With the modern vessel of the same size, the time would have been less than a month. The weather was favorable, no storms of wind and rain, but generally clear skies, with fogs at night, but absent by day. They reached the Santa Barbara Channel in the pleasantest part of the year, after the long dry season, and the country apparently much parched. They had no difficulties with the natives, and we may well suppose that they looked forward with hope and confidence to continued success and the prospect of the discovery of precious metals. At San Buenaventura, they established very friendly relations with the populous villages of that vicinity, with the river coming through the mountains on the west and the Santa Clara coming through the broad, flat valley to the eastward. They readily obtained food from the natives and perhaps had no need to draw the same. In their progress through the Santa Barbara Channel, they must have been charmed by its beauty and by the friendliness of the natives, for they anchored half a dozen times. Cabrillo says, they sailed little in several days on account of the too fine weather, and on Wednesday, the 18th of said month, October, they arrived at a long point which forms a cape, and on account of its length, like a galley, they named it El Cabo de la Galera. This is the point conception of our charts. The weather of the Santa Barbara Channel at that season of the year is extremely lovely. When at point conception for three and a half months in 1850, I have seen sailing vessels five or six days in irons drifting slowly from Santa Barbara to Point Conception with the weak current to the westward while outside the Cape a steady ten knot breeze from the northwest was blowing for weeks. A vessel bound to the northwestward and opening from under the lee of the Cape would frequently be reduced to short canvas in an hour. At that season of the year the southeast storms which bring up the rain are due and Cabrillo and Ferrello soon experienced them. Through this channel passage, I have been able to locate every anchorage which the vessels made, and have disentangled the parallel range of the Santa Barbara Islands, which from certain points of view overlap each other. Even the confusion of double names which they used has been made clear. From Point Conception, the strong northwest winds forced the vessels down upon the westernmost of the Santa Barbara Islands, 23 miles southward from Point Conception, where they were compelled to remain in Port Possession, Kyler's Harbor, eight days because a southeaster had sprung up with rain and the weather was very stormy. Here Cabrillo formally took possession of the country. After leaving this island on the 25th of October for the mainland, they met with very severe weather north of Point Conception and struggled heroically until the 1st of November when they could not carry a palm of sail and sought shelter under that cape at the anchorage of the Coxo Viejo, where there was a large village called Zexo. Wood was scarce at this place, and the vessels changed their anchorage to that off the Gaviota Pass, about ten miles to the eastward, where the Indians had two villages, and there was an abundance of wood, water, and fish. It is an open roadstead, protected in part by large fields of kelp. The intercourse of the Indians and the navigators was evidently very satisfactory to both parties, and the vessels remained at anchor until the 6th of November, when they left for the Cape with very light airs, which gave them no steerage way, for they were four days making twelve or thirteen miles. Off the Cape another southeaster came up, and the vessels ran before it, making good progress, and sufficiently close to the land to assure themselves that there was no southeast anchorage. On the 11th of November, the vessels were under the shadow of the compact, bold, and precipitous mountain barrier of the Sierra Santa Lucia, which rises in latitude 35 degrees 54 minutes to an elevation of over 5,000 feet at a distance of not quite three miles inland. Here the southeaster broke upon the vessels in all its fury. And at four o'clock in the night, being in the sea about six leagues from the coast, lying to, waiting for daybreak, so great a storm struck them from the southwest and the south-southwest, with rain and dark cloudy weather, that they could not keep up a hand-breadth of sail, and it made them scud with a small foresail 
with much labor all the night, and a great sea that nearly engulfed them, and at dawn, the wind blowing tremendously, it was not possible to run before the wind, and on account of the strong sea, wind, and dense clouds, one vessel lost sight of the other, and that one vessel threw overboard everything that could lighten her from the deck, because the storm was very great, and on the Capitana, seeing themselves in the greatest danger, they vowed a pilgrimage to Our Lady of the Rosary and the Blessed Mother of Pity for her mercy, and she favored them with a little fair weather. Cabrillo Ferrello. Ferrello continues that on Monday, the 13th of the said month of November, at the hour of Vespers, the weather cleared up and the wind veered to the west, and immediately they made sail and went in search of their consort, steering toward the land, praying to God that they might discover her, as they much feared that she would be lost. They were running to the north and to the north-northwest, with the wind west and west-northwest, and the following Tuesday at daybreak they had sight of the land, and they were able to hold on until the evening, and they could see that the land was very high, and they cruised along the coast to discover if there was any port where they might take shelter, and so great was the swell of the sea that it was fearful to behold, and the coast was bold, and the mountains very lofty, and at evening they lay to for rest. It is a coast running northwest to southeast. They perceive the land at a point where it projects into the ocean, which forms a cape, and the point is covered with trees, and it is in forty degrees. He afterwards adds that these grand sierras were covered with snow and many trees. I have given this long extract because this landfall is the farthest land they reached in this first attempt to trace the coast northward. In his description, he does not refer to any jutting point of cliffs on the immediate shoreline. It is the bold, high, transverse, wooded spur of the coast mountains, nearly overhanging Fort Ross Cove, in latitude 38 degrees 31 minutes, and gives a correction to Cabrillo and Ferrello's determination of 1 degree 29 minutes. Cabrillo says they called it Cabo de Pinos, and observing the sun, they found themselves in 40 degrees and more to the northwest, from whence they recognized more than 15 leagues of coast, all the land high, and the coast running from northwest to southeast. The vessels were evidently not near enough to this rocky, dark, and forbidding coast in winter storms to see the details of the high, jagged cliffs forming the shoreline, which is fringed with outstanding rocks and hidden dangers marked by breakers. This bold shoulder, covered with the great forests of fir, was subsequently the distinguishing mark for the Russian otter hunting ships when seeking the small northwest anchorage of Fort Ross Cove. The massive character of the orography is well exhibited in the latest edition of the chart of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey. On the 15th of November, the two ships had sight of each other, and their experience through the last storm compelled them to return to the southward. On the 16th, at daybreak, they were arrived at a great gulf that looked like a harbor, and which was formed by a change of the direction of the shore, which appeared to have a port and a river and they went beating about this day and the night, and the Friday following, until they saw that there was no river, nor any shelter, and to take possession they cast anchor in forty-five fathoms. They did not dare to land on account of the high sea. This gulf is in thirty-nine degrees and more, and it is all covered with pines to the sea. They gave it the name of La Bahia de los Pinos. The following night they lay to until daybreak. Ferrello. The change of direction of the shore here mentioned is the projection of the great head of Point Reyes more than twelve miles outside the general trend of the coast, and the great gulf under it is the present gulf of the Farallones, which is understood to embrace the area between Point Reyes, the groups of the Farallones, and Point San Pedro, including the Golden Gate to San Francisco Bay, and the anchorage of Drake's Bay under the eastern extremity of Point Reyes Head. It is very interesting to note what Ferrello states about this gulf, because it was evident to his nautical eye that the discolored water therein indicated the presence of a great river. As they were near enough the land to be satisfied that no landing could be made on account of the large swell, and as they lay particular stress upon the forests, I judged they were beating in the northern part of this gulf to secure an anchorage under the north shore, but failed. 
These discolored waters were brought down by freshets from the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. They are known to all our vessels and are particularly marked after great storms. From the summit of Point Reyes, I have watched them carried by the littoral drift or the Davidson inshore eddy current far to the northward of Point Reyes, and they extend well outside of the Farallones. With more favorable conditions of weather, such persistent efforts for exploration would have rewarded these men with the discovery of Drake's Bay and doubtless the Golden Gate. When they had decided that further search was useless, they anchored and took possession of the country through the slender hold of their cable. With the depth of 45 fathoms, the vessels must have been either six or seven miles from the southeast Farallone, outside the line, thence to Point Reyes, or more likely five miles southeastward from the southeast Farallone and in about latitude 37 degrees 40 minutes. Inside of these depths, the plateau of the gulf decreases very gradually and regularly in depth toward the shores and toward the bar of the Golden Gate. In the position southward from the island, the correction to Ferrello's latitude is about 1 degree 30 minutes. It is a rather curious fact that neither narrative refers to the two groups of the Farallones, close to which they must have anchored. The northwest group comprises four principal islets within an area of one mile by a quarter of a mile, and exhibits five or six high rocky peaks, of which the highest is 155 feet. The southeast Farallone has an area of about one mile by three quarters of a mile, is very irregular in outline, and broken into four or five bold granitic peaks, of which the highest is 340 feet above the sea, and is visible from a ship's deck at about 20 miles. Drake, in 1579, anchored under the eastern point of Point Reyes Head in the northernmost part of the Gulf of the Farallones, and named the two groups of islets. From the southeast Farallone, his vessel obtained a large supply of fresh sea lion meat. Vizcaiano does not mention the groups of the Farallones in his published narrative, but they are laid down on his plans. The great storm which Cabrillo's vessels had encountered had covered the mountains of the peninsula of San Francisco with snow, and Ferrello, in describing the coast from the great gulf southward, says, All the coast they pass by this day is very bold, and there is a great swell of the sea, and the land is very lofty. There are mountains which rise to the sky, and the sea beats upon them. While sailing near the land, it appears as if they would fall upon the ships. They are covered with snow to the summit. They gave them the name of Las Sierras Nevadas, and the principal one forms a cape which projects into the sea, which they named El Cabo de Nieve. The coast runs north-northwest and south-southeast. It does not appear that Indians inhabit this coast. This Cabo de Nieve is in 30 and 8 degrees and two-thirds, and always, when the wind blew from the northwest, it made the weather fair and clear. Cabrillo says they were seeking for a port, and hence the minuteness of the foregoing narration. The snowy cape and the erroneous latitude, 38 degrees 40 minutes, has given rise to much speculation as to its identification. The description of the navigators, although somewhat exaggerated, is sufficiently good to satisfy one who is acquainted with the characteristics of this high backbone of the peninsula and with the occasional high cliffs, and is quite satisfactory to those who have encountered heavy snowstorms in the coast range of mountains. In some very heavy southeasters, such as that we experienced in the Santa Lucia range early in January 1880, the cold is quite severe, reaching 17 degrees Fahrenheit, the force of the wind terrific, and the depth of the snow two or three feet. This Cabo de Nieve, or Snowy Cape, is the massive western spur or buttress of the high mountains of this part of the peninsula of San Francisco, and rises abruptly and immediately behind the low, rocky, and dangerous point Año Nuevo. Mount Bache, or Loma Prieta, in the crestline of the mountains, lies nearly east of this cape in latitude 37 degrees 6 and a half minutes, and reaches an elevation of 3,825 feet 20 miles from the coastline on the same parallel. A vessel passing three or four miles outside the shore would rarely notice Point Año Nuevo, except from particular positions, but all vessels following the coast notice the mountain mass projecting beyond the lower hills to the north and south, although it does not break the regularity of the shoreline. 
This is another of those cases when the vessels laid great stress upon the large features of the coast, and not upon any details of the immediate shore. I'm thoroughly convinced of the identification of this cape. The correction to the determination of the latitude of both ships is 1 degree 31 minutes, where the average of this region is 1 degree 25 minutes. The narratives mention no further details. Even with fair winds, the vessels were not tempted to follow the gradually curving shore to the eastward, where under Point Santa Cruz, in latitude 36 degrees 57 minutes, they would have found anchorage and protection from the northwest swell. Nor did the gulf of the present bay of Monterey allure them. Far to the southward, the mountains of the northern part of the Sierra Santa Lucia were already looming up above the horizon, and on the following Saturday they were running along the coast, and at night they found themselves off El Cabo de San Martin. El Cabo de San Martin is in 37 degrees and a half, which latitude must have been noted from what they observed on their trip to the northward. We may very well conceive that the scurvy was among the crew, and that their provisions were not plentiful. Moreover, Ferrello's vessel was leaking very badly, and Cabrillo was suffering from his broken arm. They knew that in the port of possession, on the north side of San Miguel Island, the anchorage in that small bay was protected from the southeast gales. They anchored here on Thursday, the 23rd of November, and because it is a good port, they repaired the small vessel and made her staunch, because she was going to sink. In the aforesaid port, they remained until the end of December on account of the bad weather, with great cold and snow, even to the sea level, rain from heaven and heavy clouds, and as the southeast storm was continuing, there was so great a surf, although in a landlocked harbor, that sometimes for three or four days it was not possible to go on shore. On the 3rd of January, 1543, the brave Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo died from the effects of an accident at his first visit in October, 1542. He earnestly charged Bartolome Ferrello not to give up the voyage of discovery, but to continue his explorations to the northward. Who succeeded Ferrello to the command of La Victoria is not mentioned, but we may suppose he was the pilot Bartolome Fernandez. On the 19th of January, 1543, Ferrello and his consort set sail for the mainland under Point Conception in search of provisions. The vessels were caught by a heavy northwest storm, and for eight days were driven about among the Santa Barbara Islands, seeking anchorage on account of the foul winds, when they again sought shelter in port possession on the 27th of January. They remained here two days when the weather favored them, and they sailed to the island of Santa Rosa to recover the anchors which they had left there when they slipped their cables in a storm. They recovered the anchors and took in a supply of water from Becker's Bay, which is on the northeast face of the island, where they were protected from the southeast storm, which brought much snow. On the 13th of February, they stood across the Santa Barbara Channel to the Gaviota Anchorage, which they were forced to leave after getting only one boatload of wood. The southeaster brought up a very heavy swell, and they sought shelter under the island of Santa Cruz, because they were there more secure from the storms, and they might be able to make sail and run out to sea. On the 18th of February, the vessels left this island in search of other islands reported to them by the Indians. These islands were doubtless San Nicolas and San Clemente, which had not been seen by them, and at dark they were about twelve leagues from Santa Cruz, and saw six islands, some large and others small. At daybreak of the 19th, they were about ten leagues to the windward of the islands, and with the wind west-northwest, they were standing off five days to the southwest, and after they had proceeded about one hundred leagues, they found the wind more violent and the sea high, and Thursday, the 22nd of the said month of February, they again stood in shore to endeavor to reach Cabo de Pinos, with the wind south-southeast, which continued three days and was increasing each day. This brief search, wherein it is doubtful if they made one hundred leagues from the islands, has led Cole to make the unaccountable blunder of supposing that the six islands of the Santa Barbara groups, which Ferrello mentioned, were doubtless the Sandwich Islands. If we suppose that the course made by Ferrello was south, halfway between Santa Cruz and San Nicolas, he would probably have seen, in all, the islands of San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, Santa Catalina, with Santa Barbara in line and not distinguishable, and San Nicolas. He could not have seen San Clemente. 
Anna Capa is small but high, and Santa Catalina would at that distance appear small. San Nicolas would have been seen moderately small, because he would make it endwise. When the unusual moderate wind from the northeast changed, and the west-northwest wind came up with the large sea always accompanying it, it is very unlikely that the ships proceeded even 200 miles instead of 100 leagues. Moreover, when Ferrello changed his course to make his landfall, and the south-southeast wind continued with increasing force and with a necessarily heavy and broken sea, he must have made, by his own account, more than 500 miles in less than three days under short sail. He got sight of the Cabo de Pinos in latitude 38 degrees, 31 minutes, at daybreak on the 25th of February. This alone should demonstrate the erroneousness of Cole's supposition. When Ferrello made the mountains behind Fort Ross at daybreak, he continued his course to the northwestward, and the vessel at dusk was twenty leagues to windward on a coast running northwest and southeast, and it is bold and without shelter. There was no smoke seen on the land, and they saw a point which formed the extremity of the land, which changed the coast to the northwest. In the middle of the night, the wind suddenly shifted to the south-southwest, and they run to the west-northwest until day. And in the morning, the wind shifted to the west-southwest with great violence, which held on until the following Tuesday, the 27th. They ran to the northwest. This is Ferrello's narrative, and he gives no latitude. The point which he saw at dark was Point Arena, in latitude 38 degrees 57 minutes, where the shoreline, which has been trending to the northwest, makes a gentle sweep to the northeastward, with low shores and bold wooded mountains behind. The point is the extremity of a plateau 60 feet high and rises by several steps in three miles to 215. It is destitute of timber, but on the higher parts of the plateau, the fir trees stretch to the mountains. He doubtless saw the high timbered crest line rising to 2,300 feet elevation behind and beyond the point. Cabrillo's narrator does not write a word about the exciting experiences of the vessels from the time they left their anchorage at the Gaviota until the morning after Ferrello saw Point Arena, when he says, And Monday on the 26th of the said month of February, they were at a point which they called Cabo de Fortunas, Cape of Perils, on account of the many dangers which they had experienced in those days, and it is in 41 degrees. If the vessels scudded 20 leagues northwestward from Fort Ross in the short period of daylight, they should have reached latitude 39 degrees 30 minutes. But if Point Arena was what they saw at dark, they could not have been up to Fort Ross at daylight, but had made it out at that time. Granting, however, that they reached the latitude of 39 degrees 30 minutes, and supposing they kept their course, they may next day have seen some distance to the northeast, the culminating peak of the coast range of mountains just north of Point Delgada, where King Peak, in latitude 40 degrees 9 minutes, rises to a height of 4,265 feet at two and a half miles from the coastline. This is probably too far north, for Ferrello says, Tuesday, the 27th of the said month, the wind veered to the south-southwest, which held on all day. They ran to the west-northwest, with the foresails lowered, for it blew violently. At the approach of night, the wind shifted to the west. They ran all night to the south, with but little sail. There was a high sea which broke over them. The shore north of Point Arena retreats in a long curve to the eastward to the Usul River, and then takes the old northwest course. Before reaching so far north as King Peak, one of the great landfalls for this section of the coast to vessels well offshore is Cato Mountain, lying north 85 degrees east, magnetic, from Cape Vizcaiano. It rises to an elevation of 4,076 feet, and should be visible at a distance of 60 miles from the coast. It is in latitude 39 degrees, 41 minutes. Davidson's Coast Pilot. This would give a correction of 1 degree, 19 minutes to Cabrillo's position. The vessels were now well out at sea, and Ferrello says, The Wednesday following, the 28th day of the said month, at daybreak, the wind shifted directly to the southwest, and it did not blow hard. This day they observed the latitude in 43 degrees. With the average instrumental correction from identified points, this would place the vessels in latitude 41.5 degrees and far out to sea. Ferrello continues, 
Toward night, the wind freshened and shifted to the south-southwest. They ran this night to the west-northwest with much difficulty, and Thursday, March 1, at daybreak, the wind shifted to the southwest with great fury, and the seas came from many quarters, which harassed them much and broke over the ships, which not having the decks as in a man of war. If God should not succor them, they could not escape, and not being able to lay to, of necessity they scudded northeast toward the land. And now holding themselves for lost, they commended themselves to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and made their promises or offerings, and ran thus until three o'clock in the afternoon with much fear and labor, for they saw they were going to be lost. And already they perceived many signs of the land, which must be near, as small birds and logs, very fresh, which had floated from some rivers, although from the dark and cloudy weather the land did not appear. At this hour the Mother of God succored them with the grace of her Son, and there came a very violent rainstorm from the north, which made them scud all that night and the following day until sunset to the south, with the foresails furled, and because there was a high sea from the south, it broke over them each time at the bow and swept over them as if over a rock. On the 1st of March, Cabrillo's narrator says, When the weather cleared up, they observed the sun in forty and four degrees, with so much cold they were freezing. This observation, corrected by the average instrumental variation, would place the vessel in forty-two degrees thirty minutes of latitude, more or less, and well out to sea, because the landfalls in this region can be seen sixty and more miles from seaward. Another important statement is made in relation to the indications of discolored fresh water from rivers. In latitude 42 degrees 25 minutes is the mouth of Rogue River, which discharges an enormous volume of water in the winter storms, Pistol River in 42 degrees 17 minutes, Chetka River in 42 degrees 3 minutes, and Smith River in 41 degrees 57 minutes, besides smaller streams. In the winter freshets, these streams bring down great quantities of large trees torn from the banks. How far these signs have been seen seaward, we have at present no record. Ferrello continues his narrative and says, The wind shifted to the northwest and the north-northwest with great fury, so that it made them run until Saturday the 3rd of March to the southeast and to the east-southeast with such a high sea that it made them cry out without reserve that if God and his blessed mother did not miraculously save them, they could not escape. Saturday at noon, the wind moderated and remained at the northwest, for which they gave many thanks to our Lord. They suffered also in provisions, as they had only biscuit, and that damaged. And apparently reviewing the last few days' experience, he says, It appeared to them that there was a very large river, of which they had much indication, between forty-one degrees and forty and three, for they saw many signs of it. These determinations relate to the coast between latitudes 39 degrees 30 minutes and 41 degrees 30 minutes, in which are the following streams. Klamath River in latitude 41 degrees 32 minutes, a large stream. Little River under Trinidad Head in 41 degrees 2 minutes. Mad River in 40 degrees 56 minutes. Humboldt Bay Entrance in 40 degrees 45 minutes. Eel River, one of the largest rivers in California, in 40 degrees 39 minutes. Matol, in 40 degrees 18 minutes. Usul, Ten Mile, Noyo, and other streams farther southward. Ferrello continues, This day, March 3, in the evening, they recognized the Cabo de Pinos, and on account of the high sea which prevailed, they could do no less than run along the coast on the return course in search of a shelter. They experienced much cold. Monday, on the fifth day of the said month of March, 1543, at dawn, they found themselves off the island of Juan Rodriguez, San Miguel, and they did not dare to enter the port on account of the great storm which prevailed, which broke the sea at the entrance of the harbor in fifteen fathoms. The entrance is narrow. They ran under the protection of the Isla de San Salvador on the southeast side. This Puerto de la Isla de San Salvador is Smuggler's Cove, on the short southeast side of Santa Cruz Island. The dangers which he reports in 15 fathoms are Wilson Reef, one mile in extent, which lies in deep water off the northwest shores of San Miguel Island, two and a quarter miles westwardly from the entrance to Kyler's Harbor or Port Possession. 
The Coast Pilot gives particular warning about these dangers. Smuggler's Cove is an open roadstead with partial protection from heavy northwest weather. Ferrello, in continuing his narrative, goes back a day or more and says, And the night before coming with a violent tempest, with only two small foresails, the other ship disappeared, so that they suspected that the sea had swallowed it up, and they could not discover it any more, even after daybreak. They believe they must have been in 44 degrees when the last storm overtook them and compelled them to run to leeward. Cabrillo's narrator says that on account of the foregoing storm, they were forced to go to La Isla de la Possession, San Miguel Island, where they arrived on the 5th, and on account of the heavy breaking at the mouth of the harbor, they sought protection under the Isla de San Sebastian, under the side presented to the south-southeast, and that night of the great tempest, the flagship disappeared. After the vessels met at Cerros Island, Ferrello says, That ship passed La Isla de Juan Rodriguez at night, passing through some breakers, so that they thought they must be lost, and the mariners promised to go in procession naked to her church, and Our Lady delivered them. This is the first time the Cabrillo narrative has mentioned this island of San Sebastian. As the fragata was off Kyler's Harbor at night, probably eight or ten hours after the Capitana had passed it, with the heavy northwester still blowing, he was very naturally afraid to approach the old anchorage of Port Possession and probably steered through the San Miguel Passage and found protection and anchorage under the southeast shore of Santa Rosa Island between South Point and East Point, which he calls El Puerto de San Sebastian, now known as Johnson's Lee. He must have remained at this anchorage 14 days while the other vessel lay three days in Smuggler's Cove under Santa Cruz Island, and then searched for her consort at San Buenaventura, again at Smuggler's Cove, at San Diego Bay, Port San Quentin, and finally at the south end of the island of Cerros on the 24th of March, 1543. On the 26th, the consort arrived. When she had started to search for the Capitana, the whole crew made their demands that they should return to New Spain, as we had nothing that we could eat, and because this was in reason, they ordered the return, searching for their consort. Cabrillo's narrator. Some question has arisen about the probability of these small, badly equipped vessels, with mixed crews of Spaniards and Indians, broken down by scurvy, making such good time. It seems quite reasonable that they reached the latitude observed, and that they commenced to scud before the northwester from latitude 42 degrees 30 minutes to a position off Fort Ross, making about 275 miles between the morning of March 1 and the evening of March 3, or about 5 miles per hour. From the last position to San Miguel Island, the Capitana sailed not less than 315 miles in about 38 hours, or more than 8 miles per hour, with an evident increase in the force of the wind. Cabrillo's narrator says that in five days they ran 200 leagues with reefed foresail, and his vessel reached San Miguel Island on the same day as the San Salvador, but later. It was a run for life, and these masterful navigators must have handled their craft with consummate skill and decision. I have no doubt whatever of their statements. Concluding Remarks this is a condensed review of this heroic voyage or voyages of discovery and exploration in the very heart of our winter gales. The whole story is ingeniously told. There is no complaint of sickness or of the incapacity of the crews. To the seamen, the narrative is full of pathos. I have endeavored to point out only a few of the identifications of the two principal actors. I have not quoted from Uloa, Drake, or Vizcayano. To exhibit the details of the narratives of these five remarkable men, I drew up, in 1885, their statements in parallel columns, following the localities from the south toward the north, preserving the entire narratives of Cabrillo and Ferrello, and using such parts of the others as related to the positions of the former or to new localities intermediate. I then appealed to my personal knowledge of the localities and to my descriptions from the manuscript for the Coast Pilot of 1889, and to the Coast Pilot of Lower California. During the investigation, doubtful cases of identification were left in abeyance until well-authenticated locations to the north and to the south were fixed, and then the doubtful cases were harmonized without straining. Many minor and interesting statements noted in the narrations have been verified, 
such as the 17 villages which Ferrello names from the Gaviota Anchorage to Point Conception. On the coast survey chart, there are 17 arroyos, where we found the remains of old rancherias as we traveled this part of the coast in 1850. It is proper to mention that upon the return of the vessels to the Santa Barbara Islands in March, on their final retreat, the confusion of new names to the islands was added, but fortunately I had learned from my colleagues, who had made the detailed surveys of these islands, the advantages and disadvantages of the anchoring grounds around Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Islands under different conditions of summer blows and winter storms, and I am satisfied that the last anchorages of these navigators have been identified. Of the identification of Drake's anchorages on the coast of California and Oregon, I have not spoken, because I propose to elsewhere present a separate paper upon the former. Nor have I referred specially to the accurate work of Vizcaiano, but I may mention that, upon the authority of his narrative, it has been long asserted that a great forest covered the loma that lies between San Diego Bay and False Bay to the northward. This erroneous statement has arisen from the mistranslation of El Monte, which in the narrative signifies a hill. That is the point loma of the modern charts. Such instances as these have satisfied me that all the narrators made truthful records, so far as they wrote, and this conviction has enabled me to clearly explain in my monograph several apparent inconsistencies in parts of Vizcaiano's narrative. The mass of details presented in the monograph cannot be given in this short paper, but I presented in the report of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey, 1886, Appendix No. 7, a tabulation of the results, which established the identification of the 71 landfalls, capes, points, bays, anchorages, and islands mentioned by Cabrillo and Ferrello. I also appended a chart to exhibit in graphic and still more condensed form these identifications. It will be noted that in this list and chart there is no mention of the groups of the Farallones off the entrance to San Francisco Bay, although Cabrillo and Ferrello must have seen them. Drake mentions and names them. Vizcaiano has them on his chart, but does not mention them in his narrative. End of section 31. End of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5.